Is, is there like a way to arrange them so they're all at the top of the list? <laughs> Fortunately, no. Yeah. Um, I think we're just waiting for Dave. Is what it looks like. Um, but it is five o'clock, so I think um, I'll just get going with the remote script and hopefully uh, he'll sign in shortly. Um, so we will begin uh, tonight's uh, meeting of the Nantucket Conservation Commission. So as a preliminary matter, this is Ashley Arisman, chair of the Nantucket Conservation Commission. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mark Beal. You're muted, Mark. Um, I can Sorry, go. okay, I'm, I'm gone, good, I'm here. Okay, good. Um, I'm, doing, I'm doing it on an iPad, which is new to me. Yeah, it's a little harder to control, I think. Um, Seth Engelborg. Here. Uh, Ashley Arisman's here. Ian Golding. Yes, here, Ashley. Awesome. Uh, I think we're waiting on Dave LaFleur right now. Maureen Phillips. Here. And uh, Joe Topham. Here. Okay. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Jeff Carlson. Here. Joanne Dodd. Here. Thank you. Uh, and then anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, we have Madison Gleason. Here. RJ Turcott. Here. Uh, Brian Madden. Here. Uh, Caroline Baltzar. Here. Uh, Art Gasparo. Here. Uh, Frank Ayoit. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Here, thank you. Uh, Gene Crouch. I'm here. Uh, David Haynes. Here. Uh, Paul Santos. Here. Uh, Naomi Valentine. Here. Uh, Karen Beatty. Here. Um, and I think I might have missed a couple of you as you jumped around the screen, but I'll make sure and introduce you before um, you speak. Uh, Okay, um, so good evening. This open meeting of the Nantucket Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Nantucket Conservation Commission is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Uh, all supporting materials that have been provided uh, members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. Uh, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. Uh, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, uh, I will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you are not speaking. 
please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate me meeting minutes. Uh, for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Uh, if members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, and for items with public comment, after members have spoken, uh, the chair will afford public comment as follows. Staff will activate the chat feature on YouTube. Members of the public who have comments or questions can use this feature to communicate with the public body. Instructions are on the town's website. Uh, the chair and or staff will do their best to address comments uh, or questions. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So with that, uh, we will begin the meeting tonight uh, under public meeting, public comment. Uh, Jeff, do we have any public comment? We did. Uh, Dean Atherton had just asked for an update on the scheduling for the SBPF review. And we thought we had a date kind of picked out and it didn't work out for our reviewer um, and council. So now we are actively going through the Zoom YouTube schedule to try to find a couple dates that we could get those guys at least to put it on their schedule. And then we'll get those dates to you guys. So um, it's tough with having to be remotely and having have public meetings that are on kind of both stations. Um, or, or that the public's interested in to get that scheduled because we're competing with all the other boards and for times and then with with everyone having um, real jobs in their in their earlier part of the day for the most part um, it kind of narrows us in so we're trying to get one and hopefully we'll have it scheduled before the end of, of February and can can start on that but we're trying to get everyone at least some choices to pick from and make sure that we can have the parties present that need to be there but we're working on it i promise thank you for that update jeff it looks like joe has a question no i just want to let you know dave lafleur is present oh thank you yeah. i think he's on a second screen for me hey everyone hi yeah. dave he snuck in while we were doing the while you were reading the thing like you would just like you had requested pretty sneaky Funny that how that happens once the meeting starts everybody starts to join so that's good um all right so uh we will begin a public hearing um the following items are continued this evening so nantucket islands land bank uh, all land bank properties is continued until february 11th uh, weisenberger at 84 pacamo road is continued until february 11th uh, troja nominee trust at 26 easy street is continued until February 11th. Uh, Sweet Meadow Sylvia Lane LLC at 74 Westchester Street is continued until February 11th. Um, and then we have under uh, certificates of compliance, uh, Sweet Meadow Sylvia Lane LLC at 74 Westchester uh, continued until February 11th. That's all our continuances. Uh, so we will begin under notices of intent uh, with Town of Nantucket, uh, town-wide. We have uh, Tori Brown, Jean Crouch, and uh, I'm not sure if Rob McNeil is also here to represent this. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jean Crouch. I'm a senior environmental scientist with Vanessa and Breslin. Rob McNeil is not going to be attending tonight. Um, I just wanted to essentially use this as an opportunity to give the commission an update. Um, we have uh, been coordinating with Natural Heritage on this. We do not have a letter from Natural Heritage as yet, so uh, you can't close the hearing as yet, um, but we had um, a fairly lengthy call with them um, today, as early as today, this afternoon, uh, to go over some of their concerns, and we are going to be preparing a, um, well, we gave you a list of all the activities that we were looking to get covered under this order of conditions. And um, we are going to be putting together a little more detailed information. Uh, we provided you an, uh, actually a, a follow-up list of uh, each of these activities and uh, the, the physical work that would be done with these. Um, um, but uh, Natural Heritage is asking for a little more detail um, there are circumstances where we might be in habitat that they have more concern than in other areas. Um, so we're going to be uh, creating a matrix 
that indicates um, what's approved under their um, in, in their position, what might be approved with conditions, and then what might require consultation, further consultation with the agency. Um, I think this will go a long way to help the commission understand what's being proposed. Uh, and um, I just wanted to reiterate, because at the last meeting, um, a number of members indicated they were concerned about basically giving the DPW a free hand with, uh, with their work. Uh, this is really just to do maintenance of the, the public facilities that, is, that are already in place on the island. Uh, we're not proposing to do any like road building under this or um, you know any new work that would require a filing that would definitely require filing there's no question on that this is to maintain what's already there um, and um, in as um, uh, as minor an impact way as possible so what I'm thinking or I'm hoping is once we get this material together for natural heritage provided to the commission, it will uh, go a long way to um, uh, allow the commission to understand exactly what we're proposing to do here. Um, and uh, it'll have limits on, on what DP, DPW can do. Uh, it's not a question that we're trying to give DPW or trying to ask you to give DP, DPW a free hand. That's not it at all. Um, it's definitely going to be, you know, um, activities that have, um, um, uh, you know, that are needed that have to happen around town uh, on a regular basis, and uh, but might fall within buffer zone, um, or maybe a floodplain where it goes over a road, things like that, where there's not going to be any impact to these resources, but uh, at the same time, um, these maintenance activities are required to. Uh, make all the infrastructure on the island work properly. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions at this point, but like I say, we, we gave you a, um, a listing of all the activities. Uh, we can go through those if you wish, but um, we're going to, um, after meeting with Natural Heritage, we're going to actually, uh, actually uh, put a little more detail into that as well. Thank you, Gene. Um, are there any questions from commissioners? Uh, Mark? Yes, I still have some reservations on the whole topic of just waiving our state law as well as our town bylaw without having uh, more of a property description. I know it will be very uh, a lot of work to produce a document that would show the properties being affected, but um, I fear it's, and I, I think I mentioned to Jeff last time, it'd be helpful to have knowledge of what other towns are doing. We can't be the only town that uh, the DPW was asked us for. Um, so I'd be curious to know if there are any other towns that, that have a sort of a, a, a waiver of, of uh, all these, of all our two bylaws for, uh, for normal maintenance work without new projects. But uh, without more of a specific issue on, or a plan, management plan for the properties, uh, it just makes me a little nervous to give this to an agency. And then we're gonna be following it with a land bank. And once word gets out that we're giving this waiver, I think uh, there's no reason why other, other nonprofits wouldn't come before us. So thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mark. Um, any other, oh, Jeff? Just to answer that, and I'll, I'll resend it again if I forgot to send it the first time. So we've been able to find one other community that issued one out, um, out in Central Mass that has done this before. Um, we haven't had too much success finding others. It's something that I know in our little conservation agent group a lot of us have talked about something like this before and think it's an interesting concept and a way to get a little bit of oversight on activities that currently don't have any um, and are just done under the, the essentially the maintenance provision of the act and the bylaw um, without having had permits required or something that's in place. So um, I hate to say we're a little bit of the guinea pigs because the central mass one wasn't very 
Um, I don't think it was to the same level of detail as, as the two that we have in front of us. Um, but I can resend that around to everybody as well. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ian? So thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, without ganging up on Jean at all, um, I, I do share uh, Mark's reservations and, you know, maintenance is a, a sort of elastic um, concept. And we still have what happened on uh, Pulpis Road at Sackage Pond. I'm not sure that this is a good time to explore what happened there in depth, but I, I wouldn't want to see that happen going forward under maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, just a thought, Jeff, I know you've been talking to like other conservation commission agents. Has there been any outreach to like the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions, um, like their directors for any input? Yeah, so our local group for the Cape and the Islands, we include uh, some of the folks from MACC in there just to kind of keep them up to date with what's going on uh, and share a lot of information. I mean, just this week we spent uh, a lot of emails trading information about invasive species management and who uses what kind of plant list and what does it look like. Um, and again, this is something where kind of these, you know, larger scale routine management things have always been talked about because it's things where we see public works and off island, you know, groups like the trustees and obviously uh, Mass Audubon and some of their other local nonprofits that are managing large pieces or uh, a number of pieces where, you know, things like mowing and trail maintenance and road maintenance in those areas are something that's just always kind of taken place without permits. So we're all kind of looking at this these two specifically a little bit in a way to say, how can we condition it to provide a better level of oversight to those maintenance activities that would probably be exempt from the act? But I'll ask them again. Maybe someone else has had one come in uh, since we asked a, a couple months ago, but we'll definitely ask again. No, thank you. That's uh, helpful information. I just wasn't sure how the two groups kind of connected. Gene? Uh, yeah, um, I might offer that um, the town of Needham has a, uh, a uh, in order of conditions for their DPW that's pretty comprehensive. Thank you. That's helpful uh, to know. Oh. And I know, in, in, and I might add also, I know talking with um, Dave Paulson at Natural Heritage, he has mentioned that. There are other towns that he has worked with over the years that have these same uh, types of generic uh, uh, conditions, order of conditions for uh, DPW maintenance. He hasn't given me any names of any, but he did mention there have been other towns. Thank you. It looked like David Haynes, did you have your hand up? Oh, you're muted. Oh, there. Um, I'm on, I'm on the Belchertown Commission and we've had a generic uh, order of conditions for the DPW for probably 20 years. We were probably one of the original ones that did it. Um, it does work pretty well. I do recommend that, that any kind of a really sensitive, definitely any kind of a sensitive project be at least reviewed by, the, uh, by uh, Jeff and Joe um, and that you know what's going on, you be notified. Uh, we do allow, actually, we do allow some culvert replacement. Uh, now it all has to meet uh, stream water uh, uh, standards. And, and uh, we do allow resurfacing. And uh, the agent goes out and reviews it and makes sure there's sediment erosion controls in the proper places. Not, not realignment, not regrading, not reconstruction. Actually, Mr. Crouch did... Uh, did uh, Route 181 in Belchertown for us, um, and then that wasn't generic. That was, but but just routine it's maintenance, and it does. It it was a big project, and it does cut down on on the number of minor things that can be taken care of. Basically, with the agent looking at it and making a decision and telling them how to do it, and making sure they're on the right page. But you have to you have to write it. You have to be careful with it uh, because it can 
it can sometimes things get done that you don't like to see and they shouldn't be done and they should have been notified but that's that but it can work and it can work very well and 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 gives the DPW, it's good to be able to trust the DPW too in terms of what, how they're forming and contract uh, their their people are doing the work. But um, it does it does ease up on the load in terms of hearings before the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's um, helpful input, and it looks like we have a few other places we can uh, look to for examples. Uh, Joe, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just think each property or each situation needs to be written up and then we review it all and sign off on it and a plan that goes with it. But then I could even see the DPW saying, you know, calling Jeff or Joanne and saying, we're going to be there and can you come by and do a pre-inspection? I, I, I understand what they're trying to do, but I definitely think that everything needs to be written and documented for those sites. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Jeff? So it, it's nice to hear other people with experience because DEP was not as helpful as remembering all of these general notices of intent when they're going through them. But uh, we'll definitely dig those out and we'll find those. Uh, one of the ideas that we had had, um, and obviously trying to think about what an order would look like, is for kind of both to have, I think what Joe is looking at is a form that just says, this is the activity that we're doing that they submit into the office. We can do a site inspection pre and post and essentially sign off on that. And then they can include that in their annual report back to you guys just to make sure that they're getting inspections and they're getting checked. Um, I mean, that's kind of a, a rough idea for, for sequence and things, but I think we would anticipate that any activity would have some level of written documentation of this is what we're gonna do. The site gets inspected before, and then after the work is done saying we're done and then the site gets inspected again. Um, even if it's as simple as, hey, we're going to cut back Polpa's Road. These are the areas we're cutting to do before and then hop in the truck and drive after and make sure those same areas are acceptable post. Um, yeah, I think that's all pretty reasonable to do and it can be done in the regular kind of course of business. Uh, Joe? Yeah, just one more thing. So I think, Jeff, if, you, if that were um, put in place, then I think the same you know, we're, we're, we're meeting every two weeks, like let us know and we can do a drive-by and do our own site inspections and just kind of check on it. You know, I think as long as we know about it, I think that's gonna help speed up the process and help them do their maintenance, so. Oh, certainly. I mean, I, I don't think that there's a, a big time delay and hopefully we get, you know, a, a load of them at once to say, hey, these are the activities we're looking to do for the next month and we're gonna anticipate. And then when you get closer to the day an actual notice, but then, all those pre-inspections can happen um, pretty quickly. And, you know, like I said, we're happy to distribute any of those to, to any of you guys or put a link up on the website that says, hey, active, you know, maintenance projects. And people can just click in and check them when they want. You can go out and inspect as much as you guys want. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? No. Okay. Um, so, Gene, would you like to continue this for two weeks? No, I, I think we should probably go to a month because uh, we're going to have to get this document together. We, we're still, uh, we're going to be getting some information from Natural Heritage next week to help put that document together. Then we got to get that back to Natural Heritage. And I'm sure there's going to be a little discussion back and forth before uh, we can actually get a letter out of Natural Heritage. So I'm thinking we should uh, continue this for another month to the, uh, you know, to give us four weeks to work on this. Okay. Jeff? That would be to the 25th of February. Okay. Um, so this will continue to the 25th of February. That clears up a question I had about school vacation and meetings. <laughs> um, all right, so we will see you again on February 25th. Thank okay, great. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So we will move on to Hedges LLC at 10 Bassett Road, and this is represented by Art Gasparo. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm for you tonight with the uh, second public hearing for uh, the work in the buffer zone at this property. 
I know you have a long agenda, so I believe we were just waiting for a file number, which we've received. Um, I'm happy to go into any further presentation or address questions or concerns as you may wish. I will confirm that that's all we're waiting for. And actually, you were on mute. Something happened funny with my screen there. Um, okay, so are there any questions from commissioners? Looks like no. Um, so Art, I'm assuming you'd like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? Motion made by Dave, seconded by Joe. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Art. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Randy Sharp at one Wamasquid Place, represented by Don Bracken. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Don Bracken, representing the applicant. Um, this project is located at the corner of Wamasquid and Meadowview Drive. Uh, you may recall we filed an RDA back in uh, March of 2020 to get the wetland lines approved. Actually, Brian Madden of LEC filed that RDA. Uh, this, the proposed project is to uh, remove the driveway off of Meadowview, which, which is currently uh, partially inside the 25 foot buffer and within the 50 foot buffer and relocate that driveway uh, to the west of the lot off of uh, Wamasquid. Uh, the new driveway uh, will be porous. Uh, it uh, will be outside the 25 foot buffer. Um, the existing driveway after it's removed will be loamed and seeded. Most of that area is, around that driveway is grass already. Um, proposing to put a, a sill fence at the limit of work. It's fairly level where the driveway construction is going to be, so we don't expect any runoff from that. Uh, we're also proposing a shed just east of the house, outside the 50-foot buffer, between the 50-foot buffer and the house. There's also a large deck on the south side of the existing building uh, facing Wamasquid within the 100 foot buffer that's going to be removed in the area, that area underneath will be landscaped. Um, and then as you know, this is now um, uh, sewer in, the, in this area. So there'll be a sewer line on the west side of the house, uh, just inside the 100 foot buffer as you get toward the road. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from commissioners? Look, oh, Mark. Would it be possible to avoid even entering the 50 foot zone by having a driveway go straight in? Uh, well, they're gonna need space for parking and turning around and the way the house is positioned um, that's where they would like to have the driveway. Um, all right. Um, does that answer satisfy you, Mark? Well, it, it doesn't necessarily satisfy me when they have the option of doing it somewhere else, more to the West. Yeah. Well, I, I think that they're trying to get you know, an appearance from the road that you see the house and you wouldn't be seeing parked vehicles in front of the house. That's why it's off, you know, one of the reasons it's off to the side. Um, to put it in front would completely change, I, I think, their programming, their rebuilding as they rebuild the site. Thank you, Don. Mark? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I appreciate you uh, getting out of the 25 zone. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's much appreciated. So I I, I guess this is where it's going to be. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, do we have everything we'd need to close? Yes. Okay. Don, would you like to close? Yes. 
Is there a motion? Motion to close. A motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. Also by roll vote. Uh, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Popham. Aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Nantucket Conservation Foundation, 11 Heads of Plain Road. Uh, and this is represented by Naomi Valentine and Karen Beatty. Thank you, uh, Naomi Valentine from SWCA representing the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Uh, I just wanna start off by saying, I believe you, that, um, yes, that the commission was notified by DEP that we did receive our DEP file number today. Just for the record, that's 48-3385 since it was not able to make it onto the agenda. Um, we have not yet heard back. Well, I heard back from Natural Heritage that they're anticipating um, a couple more weeks before, let me pull up that email exactly, before they'll, actually, I take that back. They didn't give us a date, but they're not ready to give a response. So the commission will not be able to vote on this filing on tonight's hearing. Um, I did want to just do a brief overview of the project scope and then allow the commission any questions or requests for additional information so that we can be prepared for the next hearing when we do have heritage comments. Um, so the proposed project is to implement a Phragmites management plan along the southeasternmost bank of Long Pond. And thank you for sharing your screen. That's the um, image of the Phragmites uh, the purple pinkish area represents uh, very minimal uh, aquatic vegetation within Long Pond in that section. And the green area shows the densest areas of Phragmites. The yellow is uh, less dense, uh, sparse outer portions of the population. It is a monoculture of Phragmites right there, um, abutted by a native shrub vegetation just to the southeast of that population. So the plan is to do a combination of manual cutting, herbicide application, and as needed restoration activities after management in order to eradicate and bring in native hydrophytes into the area. The project work zone does span across um, the bank on Long Pond in that section, the BBW adjacent. It's also in an area of isolated, or excuse me, um, land subject to coastal storm flowage and just sneaks into the coastal dune there along the shore. Um, we're submitting this as an ecological restoration limited project um, because of the size of the area. We're not able to meet some of the performance standards. And um, I'll, I'll do a quick rundown of the exact scope of work. We plan to do pre-herbicide application cutting to reduce a lot of the biomass reduce the height of the Phragmites so that there's less herbicide that needs to be applied. The herbicide proposed is clear, clear cast, which is a salt of amazamox. Um, and we chose this herbicide over glyphosate just because of the heightened awareness around glyphosate use. Uh, it's high, more highly selective and is highly effective on Phragmites management. The approach is to use foliar application. And again, because of the pre-cutting the height of the Phragmites will be lower, so it'll be easier for the applicators to, um, or decrease their chances of overspray. Uh, the entire area will be accessed on foot because it is a pretty long stretch. And as you can see from the figure shared on the screen, there aren't existing established access roads. Our plan is to use hand pruners to just allow foot access through the width of an individual's body. It won't include any disruption to roots or uh, removal of vegetation through that BBW, but would require us to prune back the branches of the, the shrub so that we can get through, manually cut, drag out, dispose of at the landfill in a, a digester, and also come back and work our way through the Phragmites area with herbicide application. The hope is that the native vegetation, which is pretty dense, which is very dense actually, will infill as we continue chipping away at the Phragmites present. Um, but we did propose a seeding 
uh, plan to encourage more rapid uh, germination in the area, especially since there will now be exposed soil that could be vulnerable to additional Phragmites infill or other invasive plants. Um, following that stage of management, it's um, we're taking an adaptive man management approach. So there will also be post-treatment cutting, monitoring, then following another round of herbicide application, um, reporting back to the Conservation Commission on how things are going and moving forward as it seems most appropriate. So that's a summary of the entire project. Um, and I'd love to take any questions or requests for additional information that the commission may have. Thank you, Naomi. Um, are there any questions or comments, uh, Maureen? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Naomi, thanks very much. Um, I am, I live right on Long Pond at, on Long Pond Drive and, and I've been active in the, uh, the homeowners association and, and working with um, Bob Williams as well uh, from the Pond Coalition. So I've been watching this and we have been really looking forward to you all um, you know, getting your plan in as well, because as you know, it's so important to have it all, all, all the, have it all contiguous, you know, and have it done. Right. So I, I, I want to laud you on behalf of um, everyone in the West End. Uh, I think it's going to, it's going to be incredible because, as I've said here before, when other, when Bob Williams and others have been here, the impact has just been incredible. And the um, to have those gone and to see the cattails coming back is very, uh, it's just been very successful and I'm sure it will be um, with you all. I'm also um, very interested, I was very interested to see that you're using ClearCast. Um, there had been a lot of questions about the glyc, glyc of, uh, I'll never a tongue twister. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the other stuff. Um, and, um, and I don't know if, I don't think any of the other projects have used the ClearCast. Or do you know, or have, have people used it on island yet? I am not sure if anybody's used it on the island yet. I believe when I was speaking with Karen and she might be able to speak to this hmm. better, um, that the other Long Pond Phragmites projects have not used ClearCast yet. And I should have begun by saying, we're excited that this is a continuation of an already existing Phragmites management plan across the entire water body. Yeah. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Well, you put that in your, I mean, that was part I did. of it. It was in the narrative. It, it yes. was part of it. And I just, and that was really good. So it'll be very, it'll be doubly interesting to see how that different uh, substance works. Um, and, uh, and maybe that then can um, encourage other places to do it as well. If ClearCast kind of has a cleaner reputation, I'm not sure how how absolutely different it is. But if if people are more accepting of it and it does the same job, then you know I think that makes perfect sense. But we are very very excited, and then you're you're doing such a huge amount in one fell swoop. <laughs> I mean, well, that's it will be stepwise for sure. The first effort is going to be large. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, just thank you. And I think this is, is terrific and we could not be more in favor of it. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And um, before Madam Chair, you go on to the other commission members, I forgot to mention, again, this is in the narrative, but aside from seeding, we also plan to revegetate with bare root, um, beach grass, sorry, that took me a minute to pull up from my mm -hmm. head, uh, in that coastal dune area as needed when the Phragmites is removed since it does overlap into that, that existing population. Thank yeah, and, and I would like to add through the chair, um, you know, additional beach grass is obviously very import important to the, the, uh, the maintenance of the dunes and everything there. And the, we are doing Madiket Conservation Association is doing dune glass replantings as we can. So this, again, you'll be doing something that will be working with, you know, what other entities out there are doing. So it's really a, a good project and thank you. Thank you, that's very nice. Great, uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? 
Uh, Ian? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has done an analysis of uh, ClearCast and uh, most of the, in, the inert ingredients are proprietary. And um, so, so that makes me slightly wary, even though apparently the Commonwealth um, was able to get the confidential information and evaluate and recommend accordingly. And so I, I would be very curious as to where else it's been used. And um, if we could have any examples of um, how effective it's been and if there have been any uh, corollary side effects. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to respond, the uh, two example papers that I included admittedly are not from the Commonwealth. So was that included in your request to uh, have an, a couple example or two from within the Commonwealth? Oh, you're muted, Ian. Sorry, if that's possible, Naomi, that would be great. Thank you. I can I can try to come up with that information before the next hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? No. No. Um, well, I know I'm excited to see this uh, ecological restoration uh, take place and to continue um, invasive species management in our ponds. So I think it's uh, really good progress. Um, so Naomi, would you like to continue until February 11th? Um, yeah, let's do that. If I haven't heard back from Natural Heritage within a day or two, I'll notify um, the commission and request another extension but hopefully we'll have response back. There's a small portion of the outer um, sparse Phragmites population that overlaps with estimated habitat. We'll, so we'll see what their response is. Okay, um, well, thank you. This will uh, continue to February 11th then. Thank you. Have a good night. You as well. Um, that moves us on to Scannell at 119 R Eel Point Road. Uh, and this is represented by Paul Santos. Uh, Seth? Madam Chair, I need to recuse myself from this one, please. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you, Seth. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, Paul Santos with Nantucket Surveyors on behalf of the property owner and applicant, William and Elizabeth Scannell. Uh, this is the redevelopment of 119R Eel Point Road, uh, in which there will be a proposed dwelling, a proposed second dwelling, a pool and a pool house with associated landscaping and utility infrastructure. The majority of the site is actually outside of CONCOM jurisdiction. Uh, the application before you is a notice of intent simply for uh, construction of the pool and a portion of the pool house. And in fact, the majority of the pool is actually outside the 100 foot buffer zone also. This site was before you uh, back a few months ago for an RDA uh, in which no work was proposed and we came in to uh, establish the uh, resource areas on the site. At that time, it was determined the single resource area was the top of a coastal bank. That line uh, is shown on the plan along with the 25 foot no disturb, the 50 foot no build and the 100 foot buffer. There was some discussion at the time about a section of windblown sand that was found to be non-jurisdictional. Um, and although that is non-jurisdictional, the proposal that you see before you tonight uh, does respect the 50 foot setback from that uh, windblown sand. Um, I had mentioned that the night of the meeting and uh, the layout that you see before you, um, although that windblown sand is non-jurisdictional, does um, meet the criteria um, with regard to the 50 foot no build. Uh, the application itself is pretty straightforward. If you'll notice on the plan, you'll see the 100 foot buffer zone crossing just a corner of the pool and a corner of the pool house. No waivers are required or needed for the application. Um, there is no bordering vegetative wetland, no groundwater waivers required. And uh, it is a notice of intent for that specific work. And uh, at the risk of being very short, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Paul. 
if I could add, there is, in, rather than put silt fence on the plan in this particular case, I, I thought it was more appropriate to have a construction fence um, demarcating the 50 foot no build. And that is also actually shown on the plan too. Thank you, Paul. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Um, Jeff, I have a question for you um, that I wasn't sure if it was gonna come out in commissioner's comments, but since this is a coastal project, I'm gonna ask now. So I've been thinking over the last few days about some of these um, coastal projects we have. And I was wondering if we could start putting in a condition, um, essentially saying that as structures come closer to our buffer zones, so like once erosion happens and structures are within the 50, like we have a condition that triggers property owners to come in and remove structures from that area. Um, or like as they expose to the, to the coastline, you know, just to have something in our conditions, like looking forward um, to try and get property owners in once they get closer to the edge. Yeah, I think thinking about that, I think you could put a condition in. I don't think necessarily you could require the specific action at this point, but I think if you simply said, you know, should structures get within the 50 foot setback, the applicant needs to appear before the commission to discuss, you know, future management or activity on the property. I think you could do that. I don't think you could necessarily specifically trigger removal or, or, or do something I think you'd have to have because you'd want to condition the removal to some degree and kind of the restoration of that. So I think you would just simply have them come back. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if that's something other commissioners are maybe interested in. I just know we keep seeing projects and then, you know, irrigations on the beach and like, there's just been no ability for us to have oversight, like in those interim periods. So it's just something I was thinking about. Um, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? No, you do not. Okay. Uh, do we have everything we need to close? Yes, sorry. Okay. That was um, Paul, would you like to close? Yes, please, thank you. Is there a motion? Motion to close. Motion made by Joe, seconded by Ian. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Arisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries with Commissioner Engelborg recused. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and that moves us on to Killian at 10 Mayhew Lane, represented by Brian Madden. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Madden from LEC Environmental Consultants. Um, the plan before you represents a revision based on what we originally submitted um, back before the holiday break. Uh, if you remember, uh, we were proposing the pool within the 50 foot buffer zone south of the dwelling uh, based on the, the understanding of the application of a front yard setback off of the uh, right of way to Mayhew Lane. Uh, since that time, uh, we've done additional plan and title research and clarified with the building commissioner where the front yard setback would be applied. And uh, based on that feedback, we were able to relocate the pool um, outside the 50 foot buffer zone on the west side of the house. Uh, so it is um, 30 feet away from that um, front yard setback that runs parallel to, to Mayhew and does not include that jog out uh, on that kind of weird um, terminus to the to the roadway. Um, in addition to um, that revision and to address some of the groundwater concerns that were raised previously, uh, we are proposing to raise the pool uh, to elevation 17 uh, and propose a four foot fiberglass pool uh, to minimize that foundation depth in comparison to a typical concrete uh, pool foundation. And so the bottom of the pool will be set um, 
just above the redox features that were encountered. Um, it's not uh, anticipated that there will be a need for dewatering out here. And um, we believe based on those pool revisions that the adverse impacts uh, to groundwater in the resource area with the, the BVW to the north and the IVW to the south uh, will be protected. And uh, the, com the appl applicant remains committed to the uh, restoration of that isolated vegetated wetland in the 25 foot buffer zone as originally approved or proposed rather. And uh, I'll turn it over to questions at this point. Thank you, Brian. Any questions or comments from commissioners? Oh, Seth can go. Oh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm happy to see the pool be moved out of the 50 foot buffer and I'm also happy to see that the applicant's still willing to uh, move forward with restoration of the IVW to the south, which I think would be great. Um, it seems like it's kind of not functioning as it needs to be right now with a lot of um, shrubby cover kind of invading on that area. I think that's great to, if the applicant's willing to continue to do that, to um, make a more functioning wetland there, that would, that would be great. And I think that in line with that, the applicant should consider um, relocating the spa and the deck that's in the 25 foot buffer zone as well. I know it's pre-existing, so we can't make them, but I think that if they're serious about doing a robust revegetation effort and returning that to a more natural setting, it would make sense to also relocate those, those features to a new spot on the property. Thank you, Seth. Brian, do you think that's something uh, your client might be amenable to? Um, unfortunately, I think that may be difficult in this situation. Um, I, I know that was a raised at that first meeting. And uh, I, I did look into the issue further and there was a, a 2004 as-built plan uh, that showed the deck in the hot tub. And at that point in time, it was outside the 50 foot buffer zone. Um, and so that was associated with the certificate of compliance. I think just based on the layout and, and uh, what the client would prefer, um, they would like to retain uh, that uh, feature. Uh, but, you know, regardless of that, I still feel that the uh, restoration work will provide a significant improvement over existing conditions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, any other questions from commissioners? Like, no. Uh, Jeff, do we have any uh, questions from the public on this one? Looks like RJ has a question or comment. Uh, through the chair, RJ Turcott for the Nantucket Land Council. Uh, we would just like to thank the applicant and Brian for working with the applicant to make the changes to the pool. So thank you, that's great. Thank you. Um, so Brian, would you like to close? Please. Uh, is there a motion to close? A motion made by Mark. Uh, I'm going to give it to Maureen for the second. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Arisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. Like that carries unanimously. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Cedar View Point LLC at 40 Shakamo Road, also represented by Brian Madden. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before I begin, Joe, do you mind um, focusing and zooming in on that detailed view, number one? Perfect. Um, Brian Madden from LEC Environmental. Um, the application involves some updates uh, to patios and uh, landscaping around the primary dwelling on the property. 
Uh, this property has been before you in the past, more recently for redevelopment of a guest house within the southern portion of the site. Um, and just the resource areas in play. Uh, further to the southeast, there's a boring vegetated wetland. Also to the west, a separate BVW system. And to the north is a Coastal Bank and Coastal Beach. Uh, the proposed work. Um, How about they can't build as much anymore? Yeah. Oh. I think we have some hot mics. We need to mute our mics. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so the proposed work is primarily um, outside of the 50 foot buffer zone. There is a little bit of work that extends into the 50 foot, but it's all located within existing lawn landscaped areas, existing developed conditions. Um, the proposed work essentially involves modification of existing deck on the northeastern portion of the dwelling, uh, removing some existing retaining walls, uh, adding some, some stone steps, installing a new pool fence outside the 50 foot buffer, uh, and adding an accrete stone patio uh, on the front part of the building, the southwesterly portion of the building, along with some regrading and landscaping details. Um, the modification within the, the 50 foot buffer zone to the deck, um, there's an existing door um, in that location, um, but what's being proposed is a reduction in the structural footprint within the 50 foot on the order of 138 square feet and increasing uh, the setback to the coastal bank um, which will result in an improvement over existing conditions. And effectively that, that deck is just a landing uh, providing access out, out of that door in that location uh, and has been minimized. And again, this all overlaps with existing developed conditions uh, and is an improvement over existing conditions. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Do we have everything we need to close? Yes. Uh, Brian, would you like to close? Oh, Mar wait, Mark, are you making a motion or do you have a question? A question. Okay. Will there actually will there be actual construction in the fifty foot zone? Uh, yes, that modification to the deck. So it's currently extends closer to the coastal bank. Uh, that area is being pulled back and then reduced in size. Just if, essentially for that landing off of that doorway on the northeast side. that answer your question, Mark? It, it does, it does. Um, I, I can't see it from the plan where, where it was. I see the new construction. I don't see the old, the older, um, the established foundation or whatever was there. Yeah, it, it, the existing line is there. It's just a little faint. I think Joe's trying to zoom in here. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I think you have to zoom in a little bit more to see it. It's, uh, I included some photographs in the file as well. Um, it's kind of a bulbous deck that bows out. And this is just to kind of make it a, um, more rectangular for access. Yeah, so Joe's tr tracing over it. Is that a waiver project then, Brian? Oh, yes. We, sorry, we, we, we have requested a waiver for that work. And again, it's a reduction in the structural footprint and increasing that setback to the coastal bank. Um, you all set, Mark? Do you have further? I am. Okay. No, I'm, I'm good. Um, any other questions from commissioners? Brian said he was ready to close. So is there a motion to close? 
Motion made by Dave. Is there a second? Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Thiel? Uh, no. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Oh, Maureen, you're muted. Yes. Aye. Sorry. All right. Uh, Topham? Aye. Uh, so that carries with Commissioner Beal um, opposed. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to 9 E Street, uh, LLC at 9 E Street, also represented by Brian Madden. Thank you very much. Um, Brian Madden from LEC, representing the applicant. Uh, the proposed project involves uh, two components. One is a uh, septic upgrade for the inclusion of an IA uh, septic tank. Uh, and there's separate plans and details uh, prepared by Green Seal that was submitted as part of the application. Uh, additionally, there is a uh, proposed upgrade uh, for reconstruction of the cottage foundation uh, that's within the uh, south central portion of the site. That's the uh, backwards L-shaped structure, uh, landward of the primary dwelling. Uh, currently, that, that dwelling, that the cottage, sits on cinder block foundation. Um, slopes from south to north mild, mildly descend. So the southerly portion of the structure where there's the ramp is effectively at grade. And then the north side is where it becomes elevated. Uh, sitting on the cinder blocks. And so what's being proposed is just a replacement of the foundation to a shallow crawl space foundation, that there will be no change in height, location, or configuration of the structure. It's simply just uh, lifting it up and reconstructing, reconstructing the foundation and putting it back in place. Um, a portion of that work uh, does occur within the 50 foot buffer zone to the coastal bank. However, the existing structure uh, occurs between the cottage and the coastal bank. Um, we are proposing um, to implement BMPs to ensure that there'll be no adverse impacts on the coastal bank. Uh, the proposed work is located greater than um, 50 feet away to the salt marsh uh, that's flagged by uh, flags one through four. Uh, nearly coincident with elevation three. And at the low end of the structure, the existing grades are around elevation 11. Um, and as proposed, we are requesting a waiver for no adverse impact. Uh, and with the IA component being integrated into the septic design, uh, we feel that it will also result in an improvement over existing conditions. And uh, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Joe. So to the chair, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Brian, on the plan, it says, is it window wells that are shown? I'm trying to, Joe, I can back, quickly back up. Yeah. I'm to the WW. Oh, that's, that's, that's not the structure that's being, uh, that's existing structure. The, the L-shaped southerly structure is the cottage. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's, but I just, yeah. you were saying crawl space and then I was, I saw that my eyes jumped to the uh, window wells. Okay. Yeah. So, so no window wells on the, the cottage. Okay. Uh, will you do flood panels? Do you think? It's out, out, outside of the flood zone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maureen? Yeah, um, through the chair, um, the uh, there was a, a letter from an abutter, um, Brian, which I, I assume you saw in the packet. I did uh, not see that. Uh, uh, because the that abutter, whose name I of course can't remember now, um, and also the the abutter on the other side just spoke to me about about having the same concern that the. The proximity of the new IA system to the wells of the residents on either side, um, they were concerned about it because of uh, a nearer neighbor 
um, who'd had problems with their well when a similar IA system went in. So, um, so I wanted to see whether you had any opinion on that. Um, and, and I guess it really is what is there, um, it was the location of the nearby wells, you know, how was that considered in the placement of the IA system? Yeah, uh, not being a professional engineer, I, I can only speak to um, part of that answer, but um, I would think, uh, you know, with the inclusion of an IA component, you're improving water quality um, over existing conditions. Um, so I'm curious to hear that there's been some perceived impacts to wells when some of this work was completed. I don't know if it was, personally, I, I can't speak to whether or not there's a direct correlation there, but I, you know, an IA integration does result in an improvement over existing conditions. Yeah, no, I, that, that's, sorry, through the chair, that's what, um, that's what I would have thought. And so I was, I was hoping you'd had a chance to look at that letter and just to see, oh no, that doesn't, you know, doesn't make sense. Um, so, but it shouldn't, I mean, given that an IA is intended to improve existing conditions, that shouldn't, it, it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't be able essentially to have an impact on the, the nearby water sources. Okay. I mean, I guess I just, I, I don't know what to say because I, I certainly can't, I don't know about that. And, and, and I know there was this comment made so I'm kind of left a, a little bit up in the air. Does anyone have, I guess that's, uh, I, I guess I was raising that and I'm not, I'm not sure if that answers their question, but that's as, as much as, that's as far as I can go. Thank so. you, Maureen. I'm wondering if um, Jeff has any perspective. I tend to kind of agree with Brian that an IA system should be improving water quality um, over like a traditional system. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the fact that the Nantucket Board of Health and, and even MassDEP in situations like this are requiring these IA systems to be uh, the compliant system, I would assume that that's for the sole purpose of protecting water quality and improving that. So I would imagine that, you know, especially to what's there on the ground now that any IA installation would have a long-term benefit. I just feel like it just happened by circumstance, like the time. So I'll also say too, just to, to get there, um, when there's a public comment that relates to it, I, I think that the other part of the comment that, that's being missed a little bit, and I'm happy to read it directly, but I'll, I'll try to summarize it as well, is not related to the IA components, but the concern about, you know, driving sheeting or something to, you know, stabilize soils prior to, um, you know, installation of the crawl space or installation of any of the tanks and the potential that that could do for, you know, groundwater in the area to, to get into wells and things, especially out in mm -hmm. the area where these, these wells tend to be a little shallower um, for, for groundwater proximity, that, you know, how, if that's gonna be happening or maybe a little discussion over the construction methodology on that foundation, if that's gonna be happening or not gonna be happening. Hopefully that made a little sense. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I think that's helpful. Um, any other uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Ian, I thought I saw your hand up at one point. Well, you, well, you did, but uh, Bill Greed has sort of made my point. In other words, I guess uh, through the chair, Madam Chair, um, yep. for Dave, uh, could driving a pile compact the soil so it could affect the uh, you know, the water table, I mean, such as it is there, it's, there's hardly any water table at all that I'm aware of. Dave, do you have an opinion on that? I do, uh, in shallow wells or water table like, like that, it, it could. Um, I mean, there's a lot of variables that could contribute to that, but um, I think like Joe said, I think it was just a hap chance that uh, it went in the same time when some other condition, something else happened that uh, showed up. Uh, Jeff? I, I was just going to offer it. It's pretty short. I was just trying to pull it up and install a little bit. If you'd like, I can read that letter specifically in if people want to hear the comment specifically. That, would that be might good. be good since um, 
Brian hasn't heard it and I think others might have missed it as well. Yeah, sure. I, so go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say, Joe did send it to me. I, I totally missed the email this afternoon. Apologies. So I'll, I'll read it just in case. Um, so it specifically says it's from Mary Chuck. Um, it says, I own and live a year round property on my property, 7D Street, Nantucket. I received your NOI for 9E Street. My deep concern is over the methods used for the new foundation because it is very close to my single water supply, my well, and my garage. Will the vibratory hammer be used to drive steel retaining walls during excavation? 11E, property adjacent to 9E, required this method last year due to the density of our neighborhood, and my neighbor's 60 Street well water level dropped and they lost their water. Their contractor said that it was due to the pile driving. I'm also concerned with potential impact to my septic system and home. My call to the health department led to a recommendation to send this email to you. What measures can be taken to gain formation to protect my property and health from potential damage and measures to reimburse me if damage occurs? I appreciate the opportunity to voice my concerns. Thank you for reading that in, Jeff. Um, I guess it's tough to have evidence of like some of this stuff, but could we condition if there's evidence that something happens to her water, um, that the applicant comes back in? I think the only issue that I have with that is that we're putting a condition for monitoring on a different property that's outside of the permit. And I'm not sure that we have the ability to directly do that. Okay. Um, it looks like Ian and then Dave. Um, well, I'll defer to Dave as the expert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, Dave, go ahead. I, I, well, I would think the only way that that could happen is you'd have to have it tested prior to and know what the condition is of the well now to see if there is change that could be documented. I don't think we could go on somebody's word. Right. Um, Ian and then Seth, yep. Um, so could we condition it so no pile driver was used? Is, is a pile driver essential to for this construction? That's a good question for Dave or Brian. <laughs> uh, uh, certainly Brian. Brian. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I mean, it's a very shallow crawl space. It's just, you know, concrete. Um, you know, I'm not envisioning the need to drive this, uh, use a vibratory hammer. In this application, um, we're talking two, three feet shallow crawl space um, with, with minimal excavation uh, based on that descending slope. Um, I, I can't answer that specifically, uh, but I, my personal opinion, I don't feel it, it will be necessary, but I don't want to preclude all means and methods um, that may not have been fully uh, designed just yet. Thank you, Brian. Um, Ian and then Dave and then Seth, I know you're waiting to. Well, then I would suggest through you, Madam Chair, to the commission that we condition it that if a vibratory hammer has to be used, then the, um, the well, as Dave suggested, that should be tested before and after. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, Dave, do you have kind of a follow up to this? Well, I was just going to comment on a, a shallow foundation. Typically, it, in a lot of cases, it can be shored uh, without driving steel sheathing with uh, beams and, and uh, shoring plates. Um, when the steel sheathing is required, it's usually if they're going to a full foundation uh, and limitations on setbacks and stuff. Um, if there's not enough room to create uh, a stable bank, then, then that's where sheathing comes into place. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Seth, and then Jeff. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sensitive to the um, abutters letter, but I'm gonna bring my statistical background into play here and remind everybody that correlation doesn't equal causation. And I think that even if we did what Dave's suggesting, we tested 
water level before and after, it would have to be in the same time of year, in the same hydrological type season. And we'd have to exclude the, the fact that any other um, co-variables made a difference. And I think the, the only thing we would get is observational inferences here. There's no way to empirically say whether that steel sheeting, I think in my opinion, is actually causing the water level in that well to drop. So I, I'm fine if people wanna put conditions into place, but I think that there are so many other factors in a complex environment, like a shallow water table that is put, posing undue um, restrictions on a, on a project. But that's my opinion here. I think if there's ways to, um, you know, not use the sheeting or not use the vibratory hammer or use the, the least minimal um, insulation procedures possible, do that. But I, I don't really know that we can say empirically that driving sheeting is causing someone's well to go dry. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Jeff? I mean, I, I don't want Brian to, to throw the daggers at me, but I, I think this may be a case that, I mean, you guys could ask for a little bit more clarity on the what the construction protocol would be on replacing that foundation. My gut feeling tells me that there's going to be some level of sheeting used just because the current condition is it's right adjacent to the property line. And they're not going to be able to excavate onto the abutter's property. But I think especially given the, you know, the, the size of the structure and the location and the depth, my gut feeling tells me that it's going to be one of those installations where you see, I think like Dave said, probably some beams that are, are set into the ground and then probably can almost get away with some, some heavy sheets of plywood to just hold the, the sides up for the, you know, the three foot excavation that's going to be there. It's not going to be a, you know, a, 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 a 10 foot deep excavation. So I think maybe asking for that would probably alleviate that. And I know that's a little extra work and a little bit of a delay, but I think knowing what the, the plan is for at least that side of the building, the other side may not need it at all that even if it's just one side to know for sure what the, the plan is a little bit may be helpful. Sorry, Brian. Thank you, Jeff. I think that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can certainly provide that information. Um, and, and as Seth was uh, d mentioning, I think it is somewhat of a slippery slope and to do uh, well testing um, because it's, it'll be difficult to pinpoint any uh, conclusions there. Uh, but we can certainly provide some a little bit more detail on the construction sequencing and methodology. Thank and you. again, not to, to harp on a point, and I apologize for interrupting, requiring testing on an adjacent property that's not part of the application is not something that I believe we have the ability to do. Yes, thank you, Jeff. I think we hear that loud and clear. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments from commissioners before we look at the public? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have public comment on this one? We do. I think it's been addressed, but I'll read it really quickly. Is Bill Greeter said, suggest the letter be read into the record. The concern was not the installing of the system, but question about the, uh, the sheet driving. Uh, water quality was not the issue. And then he just added, there was extensive sheeting used for previous installation the construction process should be fully explained. Thank you, Jeff. It looks like RJ has a comment or question. Yes, thank you, Chair Ashley. Um, just a quick question probably for Jeff. In areas that are this close to the resource area, specifically the harbor, um, has the Department of Health ever really brought up using a tight tank in these cottages or is that just something that they're not interested in doing? Thanks. Um, that may be a better conversation to have offline, RJ, because there's a really long answer to that. Um, the answer is yes. The problem that you have with, with tight tank and location is DEP views tight tanks is essentially a method of last resort. And if you can still get a Title V compliant system on a lot, they do not allow tight tanks. Um, that's the, the short cliff note version. 
but um, I'm happy to set up a timer. I'm sure we could get, you know, Roberto or Artel from the health department to go over that in more detail, but that's kind of the abridged version of that answer. Thank you, Jeff. Um, all right, I think that's probably it for public comment. Um, so Brian, would you like to continue for two weeks to get more information? Please. Okay, so this will continue until February 11th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and that moves us on to Old North Wharf Company Incorporated at Old North Wharf, represented by Art Gasparo. Oh, you're muted, Art. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this application is uh, uh, to replace the deck boards on the pier that runs from the end of the solid fill pier of uh, Old North Wharf out to the two slips, the area highlighted in red. And um, this would be a replacement in kind. The work would all be done uh, from the pier. There'll be no work uh, on a float. Essentially the boards will be unscrewed and new boards screwed back down. There'll be no cutting out above the harbor. Um, and that's, that's the extent of the work. Um, I think because of the location out above the, uh, the harbor, uh, I consulted with, um, with staff and felt that uh, the level of activity would be best to have reviewed by the commission and be sure that it was conditioned. Thank we you. have received, I'm sorry, we have received sign off from Division Marine Fisheries as well as a file number. Perfect, thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Jeff, do we have any questions from the public on this one? No, you do have all the required information as well. Perfect. Um, Art, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? Sure. A motion made by Ian, seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. That carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to 59B Pulpus Road LLC at 59B Pulpus Road, also represented by Art Gasparo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a notice of intent application for work within the buffer zone to um, uh, an isolated vegetated wetland. Uh, this project probably looks very familiar to you. This was the um, RDA from the previous meeting that the commission felt uh, should be filed as a notice of intent. So we've come back to you uh, with a couple of changes based on the discussion at the other meeting and a little bit more information. Um, the, um, uh, the resource area boundary remains as flagged by Brian uh, Madden and shown in blue on the plan. We um, show in red the 38-foot uh, no-disturb zone to maintain greater than percent of the area between the 25 and the 50 as no-disturb. Uh, also shown in red is the 50-foot buffer zone and the 100-foot uh, buffer zone. The, um, we have added a proposed split rail fence along the 38-foot line, the no-disturb line, to demarcate that going forward as a result of uh, discussion at the uh, previous meeting, there would also be uh, sill fencing uh, temporarily during construction assault along that line. We've shown um, more detail on the, on, on the grades existing and proposed in the area and reduced the size of the pool as well um, in, within the buffer zone. The um, uh, additional information we also provided from, uh, from Mr. Madden, he um, uh, had another look at the resource area. Again, we're outside of the window to um, uh, definitively determine uh, status as vertical pool. But again, uh, it hasn't been certified by the state and all uh, indications that, that you know, this time of year and uh, exposure is that um, we, you know, it, it's not likely to be a vertical pool. And uh, we hope that uh, the commission agrees and that the project uh, can be conditioned and move forward. I'd be happy to address questions or concerns that you may have. Thank you, Art. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Joe? Uh, Art, through the chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Art, I just want to say thank you 
for uh, doing that extra steps and not um, stopping at the 38 foot line, uh, reducing the pool. And Brian, thank you for your letter, which I think was extremely helpful. So I'm fine with the latest revisions. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Uh, we do not, and we do have all of the required information for this one as well. Okay. Um, so Art, at this point, would you like to close? Uh, yes, please. Uh, is there a motion to close? A motion made by Joe, seconded by Seth. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Phillips? Oh, aye. Uh, Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, Art. Uh, and that moves us on to Lynn F. Berlin at 2 Francis Street, uh, represented by Art Gasparo. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a proposed project within, uh, solely within land subject to coastal storm flowage. And um, shown uh, in red is a proposed uh, reconfigured driveway. There's an existing um, uh, gravel driveway in this area and we're making it just a little bit wider and putting in an apron. It's been a, a recent division of this property. And um, uh, that's the extent really of the, of the work that's proposed is to um, block off the driveway at the road um, with another piece of granite curb and then, um, and then build this uh, small, uh, you know, gra really gravel driveway, gravel road, um, maintaining all existing grades. Thank you, Art. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public? Nope, and you do have all the required information for this one as well. Perfect. Art, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? Motion made by Joe, seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you, Art. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to 212 Pulpus Road Nominee Trust at 212 Pulpus Road, represented by David Haynes. Uh, good evening, all. Um, this is a notice of intent to uh, uh, construct a, a house on the lot at 212 Pulpus Road, which is off of Quays Pasture Road, actually. The access comes in that way. The uh, they were working on the house, doing uh, renovation, and uh, decided that the condition it should be torn down, and they tore it down, and then they realized that they probably should have filed a notice of intent for that. So we are before you now with a, a partially uh, done job where they they have torn down the house, but are going to build want to build a new house on the same footprint, on the same foundation. Um, the the area is uh, within the buffer zone to both a bordering vegetated wetland and a coastal bank by policy at elevation uh, eight. Um, that's a wetland system that comes in from the beaches out there. The, there's a coastal bank and a beach out by the by the harbor. I apologize for the shortness of the delineation. This is everything within 100 feet, but it was hunting season, and I didn't, I didn't like it out there, uh, so I, I uh, cut it short. But th these are all resource areas within 100 feet of the of the uh, of the work area. There was a larger uh, delineation done previously uh, that that does show that. Um, the area is within natural heritage uh, uh, priority and rare species habitat. It 
um, we are we have submitted that to Natural Heritage for review. We have not heard back from them yet as of yet. So we will be asking for a continuance for two weeks to, to complete this project. Uh, no regrading will occur. There's a silt fence proposed around the limit of work. The existing limit of brush will remain. There will be a, no work will be within 50 feet of the wetland. Uh, the house is probably half in the buffer zone. Um, there will be the landscaping, normal landscaping of lawn and, um, and, and landscaping around the house and no regrading. Any excess materials will be moved outside, make sure it's outside of the buffer zone. Um, and all soil, disturbed soils will be loamed and steeded as necessary to, for stabilization. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, we are asking for a continuance for two weeks. Thank you, David. Are there any uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Um, Jeff, I don't know if anyone from the public had any questions. Um, okay, then, uh, David, this will continue until February 11th. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Susan Elliott Wise at all trustees at 43 and a half Shell Street, represented by David Haynes. I think we have to thank Joe for packaging all these uh, uh, same hearings together. <laughs> um, this is a, uh, a notice of intent to install a, a, a granite um, pathway down to the, to the beach. Now, or down to, actually it's not beach yet. This is a, the Wisconsin Bluff and in this area, it, by policy, it would not be considered a coastal bank because it doesn't intersect any other coastal resource areas. Land subject to coastal storm flowage is out uh, at elevation 10, and it's that's within a dune field. Um, there is a there's the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and then there's a beach, and then there's a dune, a primary dune, and then there's a what would be a, a geologist would call a secondary dune that, that in, is, falls into your definition as a dune field. We have delineated that area, um, uh, flags uh, one through four, and it's basically the edge of any windblown sand, even thin sand. Um, and that puts the bottom of these, this set of steps within 50 feet of, of that dune field. Um, this it would be considered a water dependent use, so that intrusion would be would be allowed by your your bylaw. These are going to be uh, the steps will be three feet wide and laid on top of each other, uh, overlapping each other. It will the work will all be done by hand. Uh, no regrading is proposed. To minor soil disturbance along the edge of it that will then be loamed and seeded. Um, it, it's it's being done this way. It, actually, this project was approved probably ten years ago and never constructed. Constructed, this technique was actually a, a, a recommendation of Peggy Fantasi, the former administrator, and and it was permitted by the previous at that time. Um, so we are not within an endangered species area. There is one out by running along the. Uh, the primary dune in there. Um, and other than that, and, and all disturbed areas will be uh, loamed and seeded as necessary. Um, but, and we've tried to match the existing grade and, and come down through a, a naturalized area so that it would not uh, require any grading or steepness or, or excessive work. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, David. I understand uh, your point about this technique being previously permitted, you know, by a former commission, but in my opinion, it's 
much less impactful to use an elevated wooden staircase rather than a, a granite step installation. Uh, you still have light penetration onto the bluff. The vegetation isn't being completely removed. So I, I would like to see that considered rather than a, a granite staircase. Um, but that's just me. Thank you, Seth. I, I have to say I tend to agree with you on that one. Um, David, is that something your client would be amenable to? I, I need to go back to them. I, I didn't, I, I, for some reason, I thought it would be uh, acceptable. I like the visual part of this, especially because you don't have another structure sticking up above the top. Uh, it fits in, it'll be hidden by the vegetation. But, and also that it's actually not a coastal bank, it's a bluff. It's not in the resource area, it's in the buffer zone. But I can go back to the my client and see if they're amenable to that. If 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 it, I'd like to hear what everybody has to say, but I I would be willing to go back if that's the pleasure of the commission. Thank you, David. Oh, Arthur, are you trying to talk? We can't hear you. Yeah, we're still not hearing you. Arthur, you may need to restart your computer. Oh, I think he's maybe signing back in. Um, are there any other uh, comments or questions from commissioners at this point, Ian? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I take Seth's point, uh, but you know how I feel about the obtrusiveness of handrails. So <laughs> if the only alternative was uh, a, a wooden, wooden stairway with handrails, um, I, I think I would prefer the stone personally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Dave? Uh, through the chair, I, I like the granite uh, step system. It's uh, low profile. I think uh, like Ian says, I'm, I'm more opposed to the, the higher rail. Uh, I like this uh, setup. Okay. Um, thank you for that perspective, Joe. I I agree with Ian. I the handrails are just such an impact. Um, I understand what Seth is saying, but I do think the granite in this circumstance is better. The one concern I had was where will all the granite be cut? Uh, hopefully not down at you know at each tread. I'd really like to have it off up out of the bank and so make sure that none of that dust and all the debris is left along the bank. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. I've been having this problem for some reason when I uh, click off for a meeting and then try to come back on, nobody can hear me. Uh, in any event, I just wanted to comment that uh, when this project was approved previously, uh, it was considered to be a coastal bank at that time under the uh, considerations that were in effect at that time, uh, whereas now uh, it's not, which I think would indicate that um, uh, what we're doing uh, is, is you know, less, less uh, of a problem than it was at the time when it was originally approved in, uh, I think, 2009, in terms of the... Uh, uh, stone steps as opposed to the wood. Uh, we will have to talk to our client. We were operating under the assumption that uh, doing it the same way as it had been approved before would be the uh, most reasonable way to proceed. Thank you, Arthur. It sounds like um, Seth and I might be the only ones who are uh, more leaning towards stairs. I think when you were si in signing on and off, um, a few commissioners stated they'd rather see the granite, so. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, David? Yeah, in terms of the, 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 the stones are all gonna be pre-cut and there's not gonna be any cutting of stones or, or, or uh, they will just be taken down. It'll be dug out. The area will be dug out. The vegetation in that area will be cut down. The roots will be removed. It'll be dug out by hand, creating little shells and putting the granite on top of it. And the next one, will lie on top of each other, but they will be brought down. They will be cut. If there's any cutting to be done, it'll be done up up in the uh, yard of the house and outside of uh, 50 feet from any, outside of the buffer zone, basically. 
because the top whole top of this is no the no it's all it's all in the buffer zone excuse me but the lawn area is outside of the buffer zone thank you david um, any other questions or comments from commissioners uh, maureen i after thinking about this and listening to the discussion i i would lean to the granite as well i think that would be a less um imposing appearance and it's how long is this thing altogether? How much how much area are we talking about again? That's it's not I mean, it's like twelve steps, is it? How many? Do you remember? I guess my well, it's not a huge amount of um, you know of granite in that area. So so I can live with that. Um, Mark. Yeah, I would I would favor granite myself. I think it's much less obtrusive. Uh, no handrail, and it'll it'll blend in with the bushes. Thank you, Mark. Um, Seth. Yeah, I mean, if we're thinking about a regulatory perspective, I don't believe that the granite um, would. I, I believe that it would meet the performance standards, and I'm willing to. Uh, vote yes to that. I just think that wood is less impactful, but I think they, they both could meet the performance standards. Thank you, Seth. Um, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Yes, I'll, I'll get through everyone's exchange, but Brian Hurley, he apologies if I said that wrong, um, said that he agreed with the view of the some of the commissioners that wood uh, seems to be better to protect the vegetation. That's it. Sorry, I was rescuing the puppy from outside. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, so do we have everything we would need to close this one? I think unless there's any outstanding questions, you have all the required information, yes. Okay. Um, it didn't seem like commissioners had outstanding questions. Um, so David, would you like to close? Um, yes, please. Uh, is there a motion to close? Motion to close. Motion made by Joe, seconded by Maureen. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Yes, 3383. Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Uh, Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Marianne Jones at 6 East Lincoln Avenue, uh, represented by David Haynes. Good evening again. Um, this is a notice of intent um, for removal of an existing garage and construction of a slightly larger studio in the same location. Uh, this is all within land subject to coastal storm flowage down in the Holbert Avenue section at 6 East Lincoln Avenue. Um, the, um, it's all completely landscaped around it. There are no other wetlands resource areas within 100 feet of, uh, of the site. The proposed, uh, the existing garage is at grade um, and uh, with no foundation. The studio will be constructed um, above the flood elevation, which is elevation, I'm sorry, I, seven, excuse me. Um, and that'll be above that. It'll be constructed on pilings. It will allow uh, flood water to pass beneath it. Um, the areas that are going to be covered that are, were not covered before are all either driveway or existing lawn. Um, and so it's all landscape. It will remain pervious beneath it uh, and water will be allowed to infiltration won't change. We're not going to have any any impermeable um, 
surfaces on the ground. Um, all any disturbed areas will be loaned and seeded. Any excess material that's taken will be taken out and removed from the site. And basically, that's it. Thank you, David. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Not as of yet. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I forgot to hit. Uh, do we have everything we would need to close this one? Yes. We have a priority number? Yep, sorry. The number for 60s Lincoln is uh, SE 483384. It came in late, late today. I think all of the, uh, all of our fine engineers and consultants and our office like leaned on DEP yesterday to be like, please get us some file numbers. And they all showed up at like between 2 and 4 p.m. today. So not all of them made the, the printed agenda. Lucky. But yes, we do. We don't have any comments and we do have everything we need to close. Okay. Um, so David, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? A motion made by Mark, seconded by Seth. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Build it high. Aye. Uh, Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Fleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, David. Thank you all and stay safe. You too. Uh, and that moves us on to amended orders of conditions. We have D&B Realty Trust at 11A Meadow Lane represented by Paul Santos. Uh, thank you for the record, Paul Santos with Nantucket Surveyors, uh, representing the property owner, DNB Realty Trust for a property located at 11A Meadow Lane. Uh, Katie Mitchell is actually also, I believe, available. Um, she is the landscape designer for the project. I'm here. This, okay, thanks, Katie. This was an amended order of conditions um, for uh, construction of a dwelling pool, pool house, and a garage structure. Whereas the within the jurisdiction of the commission was a pool, the pool house and the garage. I presented this at last uh, at the last meeting. Um, we went through it. I think the one issue that was raised at the time was to come back with a landscape plan that dealt with the plantings um, on the subject property, uh, specifically planting with uh, native plantings. Um, within CONCOM jurisdiction. The plan that you have before you is Katie's uh, plan that she revised in red on the, are uh, the plants that have been listed. Um, and in fact, there's a notation on there. Plants listed in red are located within the 100 foot buffer and are CONCOM compliant. And then CONCOM compliant, what I assume would be reference to uh, landscaping with native plants on Nantucket, which is the guideline uh, that we've been provided with um, from the commission. So, so essentially the, the only thing remaining was the, uh, the issue of the landscaping. Um, I think Ashley and Seth had specific concerns with what was proposed originally. And happy to answer any questions you may have. Katie's available uh, also. Uh, again, this was a, an amended order conditions uh, for a project where no waivers were requested or, or needed. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Paul, and thank you, Katie, for updating the uh, landscaping plan to um, include native non-cultivar plants within the 100-foot buffer. Um, I'm happy to see that. I still am <laughs> disappointed by the plants being used on the rest of the subject property. I'm going to go on record saying that many of them are going to cause issues to minimally managed areas in the surrounding uh, area to the locus, but it's outside of our jurisdiction. So that is a decision that we can make. Um, thank you. 
Thank you, Seth. I, I echo um, what you're saying. And I, I really hope that Nantucket in general can be better uh, with our, our landscaping decisions uh, to protect the entire island environment. Can I make a comment? Um, yep, yeah, go ahead, Katie. Um, I actually, I watched the video from the last meeting as well um, and listened to your comments. And I gotta say, in my opinion, as a landscaper working for 18 years on this island, um, unfortunately, the plants on this list cover about 80% of the plants on any maintained yard on this island. So if that's really your expert opinion, then that to me is disappointing. Um, that tells me that you are extremely out of touch. Katie, with... uh, Katie, I'm going to, I'm going to stop you there. Um, I, no, I, have, I Katie, can speak. no, Katie, we, when we speak to the commission, we do have to maintain respect for the commission and also understand that we, we have a very good perspective of the natural environment here. And this is a request that we make to many, many applicants. Um, and as a former landscaper, I fully understand, but this is a shift that the island kind of needs to make. So please don't be critical. I, I'm meeting. just responding to Seth's criticisms from the last meeting. He was very, his tone was condescending and, you know, it just says, it just shows me that you are guys are very out of touch with the plants that are being used on the island for all these maintained yards. I mean, the plants on my list are extremely common, Katie. they are everywhere. Thank you. I think we are aware of that. And that's, that's where we're looking to, again, protect the natural environment. Some of these plants are now known to escape into the natural environment. So we actually need an island-wide shift. We recognize that they are, these are widely used landscape plants, but again, we need to, to move into the future. And that's why those comments were made. And I, I thank you for your perspective on that. Um, Seth, I'll, I'll be respectful here. I I apologize if I said anything in a condescending tone, and I do um, understand that there is a culture and tradition of using these plants and similar plants across landscape properties. My comment is not unique to this application or to the to, to this property. I think that Nantucket in general needs to. Um, look holistically at the types of landscaping choices it's making for the future so that um, we can protect our natural resources better. Uh, if, if I cause you any, um, any harm, I apologize, but I think that just because there is a, a set list of plants that 80% or whatever number it is of properties are using right now, doesn't mean that's necessarily what's going to be the best for the future of our island's natural resources. Thank you, Seth. Um, any other comments from commissioners about the amended order? It's like, no. Um, Jeff, I'm not sure if you're still there. Do we have everything we need to um, issue the amended order? Uh, yes, you do. Uh, Paul, I'm assuming you'd like us to issue. Please. Uh, is there a motion? A motion made by Dave, seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erickson, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. That moves us on to Baltzer at 66 Holbert nominee, oh, excuse me, Baltzer 66 Holbert nominee trust at 66 Holbert Avenue, uh, represented by Paul Santos. And we have um, legal counsel Arthur Reed, and I believe we have the applicants on as well. Yes. Correct. Correct. Um, thank you, Ashley. Uh, Paul Santos, on behalf of the uh, trustees, Carolyn Balser and Jennifer H.B. Simpson, uh, they are the owners of this property that has been um, in their family uh, for many years. Um, the property may be familiar to you. We came in with this application um, back in August. 
and we permitted fairly quickly a house move uh, for a property a structure that was going to be um, demolished at 60 Wall Street and it was successfully moved uh, to this property. Um, it was actually moved to the southern portion of the property on Wall Street and um, as we are today, that's, that structure is there and currently being um, uh, finished up. At that time, if you remember correctly, we had a, an existing garage that was located on the Wall Street side of the property, uh, had a driveway that entered in from Wall Street. The site, the garage itself was picked up and moved to the Hubbard Avenue um, streetscape. The resource areas that we have on the property is the entire site is located within land subject to coastal storm flowage. But we do have a somewhat of a unique situation. And in fact, there is a small isolated vegetated wetland that borders uh, this property and the property to the west, um, somewhat unique in the Hulbert Avenue area as typically we come before you with, with mostly land subject to coastal storm flowage applications. Uh, this one does have that small isolated vegetated wetland. So we have not only, um, we have with that uh, relevant buffer zones, uh, 25 foot, 50 and 100 that go along with that particular resource area. Um, I'd like to, if I could read from the original um, LEC report that Brian did uh, with regard to that small wetland area. Um, the interior of the IVW is occupied by Winterberry and Arrowwood shrubs with poison ivy in the ground cover. LEC observed minimal leaf staining and other watermarks in the wetland. The IVW is only protected under the bylaw. So it's a, it's a um, resource area that is protected under the, the local bylaw. That resource area is kind of to the left of the green shading that you see there. Uh, and it runs along the property line, uh, the westerly property line. So, Within this application, this is an, an amended order of conditions, whereas it's, there's a few different parts to it, so I'll take them kind of one by one if I could. The original garage was proposed in the easterly portion of the site outside of the 100 foot buffer zone, but obviously within land subject to coastal storm flowage. The first component of this application is to take that garage and move it westerly, so it becomes partially within the 100 foot setback to the isolated vegetated wetland. It's approximately the line you'll see, the dash line running through the garage is about, you know, 50, 50%. 50% 50 of the garage is in, 50 is out, but the entire thing is within isolated, is within the, um, the flood zone. The parking area, which was proposed previously, um, has also been shifted to the, uh, to the west. The applicant has then proposed to for personal reasons. Um, and I believe uh, Caroline's mother is actually on this call also. Um, she has occupied the property in I think all of her 82 years and it was her grandmother's property prior to that. And they are seeking to take the um, main residence, the original residence of the house and make it uh, friendly for her for um, handicapped accessibility. And in doing so, uh, the intent is to along the westerly side of the structure is create a, a handicap ramp to gain access directly to um, her bedroom. Um, I think Robbie is on the call and I'm sure maybe she may um, speak at some point along with, with Caroline. Uh, so the intent is to cr create a handicap ramp on the west side of the structure to gain access um, to her living area. This occurs within the um, 50 foot setback to the isolated vegetated wetland. Uh, so this work as is proposed would require uh, a waiver from you for that particular um, scope of the project. Also in, within this scope, I've asked for a waiver for a groundwater separation, whereas typically we wouldn't ask for that in isolated land um, or we wouldn't ask for that in the land subject to coastal storm flowage. However, because the component of the isolated vegetative wetland, that two foot groundwater separation does um, apply in this particular case. Uh, granted, everything case basically in the Hulbert Avenue area 
um, isn't a shallow groundwater situation. The garage itself is a slab foundation. However, um, the foundation system itself would um, be basically uh, located at or near the, the groundwater table. Uh, the garage itself would be compliant with the flood zone standards, would have proper flood vents, um, the grade of the site is not proposed to be changed, and we would typically handle um, the roof runoff like we would, um, like we have been doing in most of these areas, whereas the roof runoff would run subsurface to the gravel system that would be placed um, in the foundation, underneath the foundation or the foundation slab. Uh, with regard to the handicap ramp and the 50 foot setback, um, whereas the zoning Actually, the zoning um, state zoning act does exempt handicap ramps from the zoning requirements. Uh, they're not required to meet zoning setbacks. Um, but under the Wetland Protection Act, I don't believe there's any type or under your local regulations, there's any type of exemptions um, for handicap ramps themselves. I'm not sure whether the board has um, dealt with this at any particular case in the past. I don't remember it at all. But um, it is a case where we're seeking uh, the waiver for the ramp itself. The area within that 50 foot setback, I calculated from the, basically the, the area of structure, if you would, is around about 300 square feet um, within that area um, that we're, where we're talking about. Um, the landscape plan and the layout itself, um, I believe has been uh, before HDC, it has been approved. I think Marty, correct? I think Marty McGowan might be on. Yes. Um, the call. Marty is there tonight. Um, Marty, I hope we don't talk about plants tonight and we simply deal with the, the <laughs> ramp itself. <laughs> um, but the, the intent would be to um, buffer the area completely between the ramp. The area where the ramp is proposed is, is essentially now in an area that's already been disturbed. Uh, the intent would be to buffer the entire westerly side of the dwelling and match up with what we proposed for the, the relocated dwelling and the garage relocation previously approved. And I think before we had um, that degraded area was to be replanted with arrowwood and uh, winterberry. Um, I'll let Marty kind of speak to that um, particular area. But Marty is the one who's done. Marty's the one who's done the landscape design. Marty is the one who's done um, the ramp layout and has been dealing with um, Caroline and Robbie. Um, and I'm happy to kind of move this on, whether Caroline or Robbie want to at least say anything. And um, Arthur is on the call also. And we can uh, maybe take it from there and, and see how the commission is, is feeling towards this. Oh, if I could actually um, uh, bring up one other thing. Um, so we're dealing with the, with the front dwelling at this particular point. Um, we are trying to come up with um, solutions, too, for handicapped access to the, um, the relocated dwelling also. Um, if you remembered what we did on the relocated dwelling is when we moved it over, we took and recessed the, the main stairways um, for the regular access to get um, into the dwelling and provided a walkway along the front of the dwelling. That is shown on the plan that you have in front of you. Um, but we are, and it's not at this meeting, but I'm, you know, we are talking about tr trying to provide some type of handicapped access um, to the, um, the back dwelling. The front dwelling is not winterized. Obviously the back dwelling, um, uh, the Wall Street one, the relocated one would be winterized, but we're trying to at least um, come up with an area, a, a provision to provide access um, to both of the dwellings um, for Robbie. So I'll pass it on to Caroline. I don't know if you wanna at least say something first and then we can maybe let the commission speak and, and if there's any specific questions, maybe Marty and, and Arthur can, um, can um, help out here. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I'll, um, I'll let that stand and my mother and I are here if we need to answer any questions. Thank you, everybody. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I mean, I think it's important here that we don't um, set bad precedent. So I understand this is an ADA accessible uh, ramp, but our, our prerogative is whether um, any type of structure is creating an impact to wetland resource areas. And I just wanna 
you know, that to go on record saying that we're, we should really be evaluating this on the basis of um, ecology and not accessibility. I think accessibility is super important. And um, I think, it, you know, there's obviously other sets of laws that, that permit and require those things. I think given the fact that this is a isolated vegetated wetland that's um, not in particularly good shape, I don't necessarily think there'd be an impact with this type of structure to that resource area. But it's you know just important to think about this could be a ADA ramp or it could be a fence or it could be a, a deck, it's a structure. So to me, it's important to to not go down the road of saying, just because it's an accessible ramp, it's okay. We need to evaluate this on the basis of the Wetlands Protection Act. Okay. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Ian? Yes, um, so I, I agree with Seth. And um, so my, my first question is, um, why, why, why hasn't it been put on the east side where this wouldn't be an issue? Thank you. May I speak to that? Uh, sure, yes, Marty. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate everybody's comments and thoughts and uh, consideration of this application. The handicap ramp is being put in the driveway area so that an accessible vehicle can be pulled up to the ramp and access can be convenient. Well, um, Madam Chair, through you to Marty. Yes, Ian. Um, Happy New Year, Marty. We've no, thank about you. <laughs> um, but um, perhaps the, the garage should be could be moved um, so that that um, so that that type of access would be um, permissible. Because you can see our point of not wanting to establish precedent when we really draw this line. May I use the phrase "sand" without, you know, a terrible pun being introduced into the discussion? So, may I? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ian. Yes, go ahead, Marty. Okay, much agreed. By the way, I quite a bit of time and thought was spent on this, and I definitely agree with you that. Um, I considered the thought of precedent, although not knowing whether or not ADA was, um, you know, a consistent priority for our community. I think that um, the relocation of the garage create, I want to make this very clear. The relocation of the garage creates for a greater green space in this area. The entire south side of the yard is now a green space. And I've been instructed by the Bolzers to honor and respect, especially by Robbie, the pre existing condition of Halbert Ave. Cedars, beach grass, bayberries. She's been very clear that she wants not to gain a ramp, which shall I say, is not anyone's preference with aging, but yet that she is able to come and go from her home with the same consideration and respect that she's given the site for over 64 years. I believe that I've represented this um, I've shrunk everything down as much as possible. And I don't believe that it necessarily creates precedent, although the board knows more than I about this type of thing. Um, as each application I know is, is weighed specifically and thoughtfully by the board. And I'm saying this fully respectful of the idea of can we put it somewhere else? And I wanna thank you for considering this statement. Madam Chair. Thank you, Marty, uh, yes. Uh, it's Robbie Baltzer. And I just wanted to add that the way 
our house is laid out, it wouldn't be feasible to put the handicap ramp on the east side because there's no door to the house on the east side. And even if there were a door there, it would be a financial hardship to change around the whole pattern of the downstairs to move all the doors involved to be able to get um, to my bedroom, which is on the east side and to the Wall Street uh, side of the house. So I'm, I was, I'm, I'm I, sorry, go ahead. I was hoping to um, have it be on the west side of the house so it would be closer to um, a door which goes into the uh, kitchen door and then into my uh, new bedroom which I had remodeled for me so I wouldn't have to go up and down the stairs. So Madam Chair, if I can. Uh, yes, Arthur. Uh, I'd like to address the question of precedent, uh, which uh, Seth and Ian uh, have uh, mentioned, and I uh, agree that that's something that has to be looked at carefully. First of all, any decision that you make does not in and of itself uh, create a precedent. The only way that a legal precedent is created uh, is by the decision of an appellate court. Now, that having been said, there is obviously the point that uh, if you uh, act in an arbitrary and capricious way, allowing a project in one situation and not in another, without there being a good reason for the distinction between those situations, you obviously are creating a bad situation uh, in terms of being able to have your decisions be upheld and continue to maintain that position in the future. Which is why I think that it is important that it, you, if you're going to approve uh, something and are concerned about the precedent issue, that you make it very clear in your decision why you are doing it and that uh, uh, the uh, situation is easily distinguished from others that might come up that would uh, uh, present the same type of structure but not the same impact upon the wetland, which is after all uh, your function. And in this case, I think Seth indicated uh, that uh, there is probably little or no impact upon this wetland, which, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a resource area, it's defined as such, but it isn't really much of a wetland. And uh, the impact upon the interest protected by the act would I think uh, be minimal and, uh, and by the bylaw in this case. So I think if you make that distinction carefully uh, in the um, uh, amended order, uh, that uh, that would uh, uh, set up a good defense against any suggestion that the next person who comes along who wants to put a uh, uh, structure of whatever type uh, a handicap ramp or whatever in a location where it's clearly inappropriate, uh, you would be able to say this is a very different case from the 66 Hulbert Avenue case and that that would stand up uh, all the way through. Thank you. Madam Thank Chair, you. may I say something? Uh, yes, Caroline, and then we'll go to Mark and then Maureen. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, I'm sure you uh, remember, but um, the garage, um, we moved the garage off of the, um, the area, the sensitive area. So we've already cleared away a structure, a large structure, it's a three car garage from that area. Um, and uh, Marty McGowan is going to help us plant it with all the native species that are um, desired by the CONCOM, as we had discussed in the last meeting. So we feel, and we're very committed to the native types of species, and we feel that we've um, made a big improvement by doing that. And we're asking for a smaller, much smaller bit for the ADA accommodation. Um, Ashley, yeah. this is Paul. Um, is, would it be appropriate, could I just um, kind of tag on to um, Caroline and Arthur's comments and then maybe let it go to the commission from there? Um, sure, yes. Yeah. We'd rather have Maureen and um, Mark speak first. No, Paul, you can um, kind of okay. finish out your statements and then they okay. can ask. All right, thank you. So getting back to the issue of uh, precedent. So I'd like, what I'd like to do is just kind of briefly walk through what the original application was. Um, and also, again, to tag on to the fact of what this isolated vegetative wetland is. Essentially, 
it's it it serves as somewhat of flood storage in the area. That's really it's a low depression within the flood zone. Um, that function will not change. If you remember correctly, the garage that was relocated, that garage is about, it's a three car garage. So it's a pretty substantial um, building. It's 640 square feet. That garage was located partially within the 25 foot setback and completely within the 50 foot setback. So the structure that we relocated um, did not occupy, uh, we did get waivers for that structure, um, but it did not occupy in total that 640 square feet. So if we were looking at this as kind of a, a case where um, we've got a 640 square foot structure that was partially in the 25, completely within the 50 that was moved out, um, we're only asking for 300 square feet um, of, this new, of this new structure. And keep in mind that the existing structure at 66 is already within the 50 foot. The majority of that structure is already within that 50 foot setback. Um, where it, we did have a small portion of the relocated structure in the 50 and we received waivers for that. But there is a trade off here of, of what was in, the, what was in the, the resource area, what was in the 50 and what we're now ending up with. Um, at the end of the day, it's either close or in fact, it might even be um, less structure that was then there previously. And that's, a, that's a, something that's not a precedent. That's something that we've, um, I think successfully in some cases, been able to take a site that's already been developed, um, remove structure within the 50 um, or reallocate, if you will, um, within a particular area. In this case, we are getting a substantial planting plan um, in the, on the Wall Street streetscape. We are planting the completely uh, Western side of the property. Um, and we'll be honest, if this was anything other than a handicap ramp, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be before you tonight. There's no way that I'd recommend or anybody would come in and ask for a new deck inside um, the 50 foot setback. But in this particular case, I think there are um, cases to be made for the resource area, which is you know, um, specific to this site. And also the fact that um, we have started out on this project by removing um, 640 square feet of a garage um, outside of the 25 and outside of the 50. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so Mark, you had a comment and then Maureen. Yes, I had a question for Paul, if I may, through the yep. chair. Uh, Paul, would it be possible to uh, have a handicap ramp from the second dwelling on Wall Street without doing a lot of uh, incursions into the resource area? Uh, the a handicap ramp to the, you're talking about the one that we relocated? No, the one, it'll be a new one from the second dwelling. It's on Wall Street. Y yes. Um, well, well yeah, that's fine, but the second dwelling is not where Bobby's mother um, resides. I mean, where Robbie resides. Um, is that what you're asking? I mean, obviously we would like to get a second, we'd like to get a, in that case, we would put the handicap ramp um, right along that walkway that's going up into the front porch. Uh, again, that would be also within the 50 foot setback mark. So, I mean, we do want to do that. That's, that's our intention is to provide access to both of these structures. Um, but the, the main goal right now was to look at that, was to look at the front, um, the front structure. Cause that's where, you know, Robbie resides. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Maureen. Yes, thank you, um, <clears throat> Ashley. Um, and I guess this is going more to Paul, but it also addresses things that both um, the family members who have spoken uh, mentioned. Um, in terms of looking at this um, as uh, precedent in terms of we often get, as I'm sure you are aware, um, someone, we've had people on Easton Street say, well, you let these people do this and we want to do the same thing and there are differences between the two plots but there is um it gets uh, we have to be very careful about how one decision is going to impact um you know other homes in the area and and um and be used to perhaps you know provide a wedge of some kind that would go to the detriment of the resource areas Having said that, um, 
I was thinking even before you all spoke about um, how much mitigation is possible on this lot. And clearly it, I mean, and, and Paul, you gave some numbers about um, if you take the whole thing, if you take it as a whole, the movement of the garage um, and you're going to be replacing, putting some uh, arrow root and something else um, yep. uh, that is there, is there more mitigation that could be done? I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that to me would, um, you know, if you can say there's, there's X amount of mitigation, even though we're adding this structure, then the more mitigation you can add would be to your benefit. And I, and I just, I, I can't tell you what else you might do but that's what I was wondering, is it possible to do more than just what involved that garage movement? Thank you, Maureen. Um, did anyone wanna take that question before I give it to Joe? Yeah, I can, you mean on our side, correct? Yeah, <laughs> you're on your okay. side. Yeah. Oh, so, um, so, so Maureen, basically the way this is gonna, the program will work here is everything to the West essentially everything to the west of the relocated um, structure that we brought from 60 Walsh over to here and everything to the west of the existing dwelling, which is, um, would all be buffered be between um, the structures and the, uh, the wetland area. And correct me if I'm wrong, Marty, the intent would be, we, we didn't propose any type of lawn, any type of expansion in that area. Essentially these structures become the living area of the site itself, that between the between the decks and the structure, the wraparound porch on 60, the living area is basically um, the the structures themselves. The area between the structures to the east of the property is what's already been um, it's already existing yard area. It's not a manicured lawn, but it is that is an area um, that would be maintained as as open space. But the, the biggest thing would be the buffering of that complete westerly uh, boundary of the property. And Marty's got, a, I think, a fairly good, robust um, landscape layout between the structures. Again, all native plantings um, along, that, along that westerly uh, property line. And correct me if I'm wrong, Marty, that was the intent, I think, um, from day one, even before we started looking at the ramp. Thank you, Paul. The, it's very clear from Robbie and um, Caroline, that the intention for this yard is to meet the future goals, actually, of the board. That indigenous, um, we're looking for beach grass. Um, she's asked me to replace an expired cedar, um, the bayberry, really, truly an indigenous native look that takes us back to Brant Point. This has been the instructions I've received at 100% clearly from the family. So my intention and the intention of the family in this particular regard is to create a vegetative area that functions as a retention area, as well as creates an attractive enhancement or shall I say, sort of creates a new look for the neighborhood, giving them the other people in the, op in the neighborhood the opportunity to embrace a real Nantucket landscape, which I'll be creating there. And this is what's gonna grow and it's gonna be successful. And that's what I like to do. So I feel very comfortable that the recreation of any disturbed areas, especially where the garage was moved, will be embraced as the right way to go. And I think that we need to make examples like this and especially in dense areas. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Joe, you had a comment or question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through the chair to Marty. So Marty, kind of looking at this, I was wondering, first off, what's the width of the deck to her secondary door? The, the side door of which she said is closest to her bedroom. 
I, Thank I you very much. Plans. That, um, that is just three feet, six inches, just enough room. It's four, it's four feet wide. So it, it has a railing on it, of course, so no one can fall. It's on piers. It's up in the air. Uh, the beach grass flows right underneath it, and the grade stays the same. The, um, you know, I'm looking for flow to be, sick, you know, uninterrupted. Uh, I don't want water to end up under the house, of course, um, as well as it's just big enough to get the um, wheelchair in with the ADA door. So truly trying to be specific as well as meeting the needs um, that are arriving. Okay, so just to follow up on that, please. So please. it seems like if you, not to redesign your your plan because it's nice and I like that. But if you took that plan from the Wesley side and ran along the north side of that deck and she came up the same area, then take that three foot six railing and take it straight out outside of the 50 or up at least close to the, um, the furthest northern corner of the house, then what it allows um, the homeowners to do is it, it, mitigates or gets rid of a lot of that deck within the our 25 to 50 foot area. And I think if we can reduce that area, it still allows her, you know, access to the deck, but it will be right in front of the, the garage. Then she'd come up onto that front porch and then come in and align with that three foot six wide deck along the Westley side. Then she also has access to a door, but it takes out all that ramp, all that extra decking you have. And I understand why you're doing it. And I think it's beautiful, but in the HTC world, I, I grant, I like that. But I think when you get in the wetland world, this is where I'm like, can we, can we reduce that impact? And I think having her be able to go in the two um, handicapped doorways, I think it makes a lot of sense. But I think that would be the best way to reduce a lot of that deck within that 25 to 50 foot area. And I just don't know if that's something you've reconsidered just having that deck run parallel to the face of the structure of the north elevation. And then that gets it right out of that entire well in area for you. So or if, even if it was, you didn't want to see the ramp, then you could almost hide it between the garage and the deck and the main house and just have a U-shaped one. I just think there's ways to relocate that, but then at the same time, you know, not having, um, you know, the travel so far that on a rainy, windy day that, you know, it's like she's traversing the entire lot. I'm trying to not getting too far away from the house, but at the same time, be able to access her bedroom door, which I think is on that, you know, that's back little ward, but at the same time, get in the main mass. So just something to consider. I'm, I don't want to redesign it, but that's, I think the best way to get out of the wetland area as much as possible, but at the same time, grant the applicant you know, access to a home. Um, you know, I, my dad, we had to build a ramp for him. So it's like, what is the best? And yeah, I think that this is a sadly a need we're all gonna need someday, but I think that would probably be the, meet both of our goals if you get my point. Thank you. Uh, I do, and thank you. I'm actually planning no steps to my house um, in the future. But I, I, it's very astute of you, your, your observation of the plan. Um, in the current situation, we are adding a door to the side of the house to allow for the access. Um, the addition of the ramp towards the back, what I'm going to call jut out, if I may, um, provides direct access to her kitchen apartment, which of course creates, um, comfort and security. I know if I want to go into my house, I want to be able to go in and sort of be where I want. In this situation, all the doors interior of the house, all the doors, because the place built a long time ago, have to be modified to get her back to the apartment. Um, it, we looked at it cough closely. It created a hardship that um, came up with a lot of conversation. So I greatly appreciate what you're saying. And it is why I'm asking the board's permission for this particular location. And I wanna tell you, 
I stretch this thing down to as small as it can possibly be um, to get her back there. Um, coming across the, the other side um, created another group of challenges um, with setbacks and other things. So um, I, did, I did really think about this and I hope that the board would consider it. If the board feels that this could be approved in its lo current location, I could definitely do a redesign that would take a look at removing the deck going back towards the, the jut out and revisit that with the family as far as um, coming in through the dining room and redoing all of the doors interior wise. Um, it, it creates uh, the greatest opportunity for, shall I say, comfort. And thank you for considering it. I would be happy to resubmit with revisions um, with the ramp staying where it is, but the ramp, the deck going back to the back door removed. I hope that that's clear. Um, and, and to add to that, I think what I could provide would be um, a benefits analysis with regard to structure that was existing in the 50 and structure that will be in the 50 at the end of the day, along with um, a benefits analysis of uh, the enhancement of the buffer zone to the vegetative wetland. Thank you, Paul. I think, um, you know, it would definitely be helpful to have Marty submit a plan that minimizes impact to the wetland um, to the maximum ability I think is, is feasible. Um, I, you know, completely understand the need for handicap accessibility. Um, I've had family members with handicapped issues before, um, but at the same time, this makes me very nervous because, um, you know, 10 years down the road, let's say, and I know your family's had this property for a long time, but if this switches hands, now we have more structure than we should essentially under the, um, idea that it was for ADA compliance for you guys, but then a new property owner comes in and they're essentially grandfathered into allowable structure on the property. And I just think that makes me a little bit nervous. And that's where I'd want to, again, have Marty minimize uh, the impact as much as possible um, for the plan that we, we would ultimately be looking at. Um, Ian? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, because you basically have taken the words out of my mouth. And um, I think that Joe has come up with an alternative that we might find uh, palatable. And it, it did occur to me that I don't know if the family would accept a condition that if the property was sold that the, um, that the handicap access was removed to restore it to its original footprint because I think I can only speak for myself, but obviously I'm sympathetic to a family that wants to put in handicapped access. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, I, I think I can't speak for Jeff, but hopefully we can um, see if that's a condition that uh, we could write in. Cause I think that would be a good idea. Um, Jeff, did you catch that one? I did, I, I was listening, sorry. I just uh, hopped up to get a, a, a new thing of water. So I think you can condition that. I think the, the tricky part with that is you don't necessarily know what the time frame on that is gonna be. I mean, I think obviously the, the property ownership history has been pretty clear that they've owned it for some time and there's no indication that that's, that's gonna change. That conditions that get old tend to, by, by no one's fault, tend to get forgotten over time. Um, and that's also something, you know, you also have to be sure if you got a certificate of compliance issue that that would have to be get carried forward. Um, I mean, I, I'd be happy to look into that a little bit further for a little bit of wordsmithing, but I'm not sure that a condition like that is, is always the best because you're asking them to do work that will essentially be 
on an expired permit that would require permitting at the time. So it makes administratively that makes me a little nervous, but I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of kick the tires on. Ashley, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think that uh, what we would wind up with in this situation uh, with, with, with an approval of whatever plan we wind up with, uh, I think the key point on this is the wordsmithing of the decision. And Jeff, obviously, um, is, is correct about what goes on in the future. I think there may be better ways to deal with it. For example, uh, something in the decision that would specifically call out the fact that no alteration, and this would really be uh, nothing more than a recitation of the law, but that there would be no alteration of the area that's been permitted to be um, uh, used for the handicapped ramp, uh, no alteration of that into other type of living space or anything other than the continuation of the handicapped ramp without further um, action by the Conservation Commission, which again would be required anyway, but it wouldn't hurt to call it out in the decision. Again, I think that the extent to which you can write a very tight decision on this, a very tight order of conditions that would call out the fact that, that there are special circumstances here that the uh, uh, decision that's been made is very specific to the property and the conditions on the property uh, so that it would be easily distinguished from uh, a, a similar situation that would not have any of the other factors that have caused you to take a liberal attitude toward this one uh, would, would be the way to go. And I'd be happy when the time comes to perhaps discuss some of the language that could go into that. Uh, with, with Jeff so that, um, you know, your, your interests would be protected, which I fully understand. I mean, the last thing anybody wants in a circumstance like this uh, is to open a hole that you can drive a truck through. And uh, I, th I think we can make sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. I appreciate those suggestions. It's very helpful. Um, uh Madam Chair, may I just, I just wanted to answer um, the concern about this house being sold. We've, uh, we're the fifth, we have fifth, a fifth generation is in there now. We've had it for 98 years and my mother um, is not able to get back onto the call. She had some technical difficulties and I'm glad because I think it's very embarrassing for her to no, have I'm here. to the oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say that we do not want a handicap ramp in the front of our house because it will not look well and it's embarrassing, um, I know, for people who will be using it. And so we have um, very carefully considered this. We are very interested in the same interests as the ComCom -Com, and we're glad to have gotten the garage out of there and have Marty helping us replant. Um, and we are very interested on the street of Halbert Avenue to have things look like they did in the old days instead of high cultivation. And we're hoping that Marty will kind of start a new trend in that way by um, uh, restoring that area to a, a wild beauty. And so we, I want to reiterate that we are very respectful of the concerns and that the handicap ramp is, it's very neatly designed, I'm sure you can see there, but it's also um, very tight to the house and um, we'll be protecting that area going forward. Thank you, Caroline. And um, we definitely appreciate your use of native plants and to, to look at historical Nantucket and to bring your property back. So that's definitely not lost on me and I don't think it's lost on any of the commissioners either. So thank you. <laughs> hey, just a bit of history here. So Robbie's grandmother, actually, yeah, Robbie's grandmother designed the house apparently on the back of a paper bag. Some 98 100 years ago apparently she wasn't too keen on the uh she should have pushed this house a little bit further to the west i guess <laughs> <laughs> but apparently there's a paper bag somewhere with this house design that robbie's grandmother did so it's very cool um any final thoughts or comments from commissioners so it sounds to me like we need to continue this one for two weeks for just a little bit more information and possibly a tweak of the um, plan. Uh, Madam Chair, would it be at all possible to at least approve putting the 
a garage down where we've asked to because um, it's been hanging up in the air and there's some structural issues with trying to get it settled on a foundation. Um, so if we could at least clear that part, it would uh, relieve me greatly. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we can do this in two parts since it's one application. Um, but I don't think, I mean, you can't go forward with the work, but I don't think commissioners have a, a problem with that aspect. Um, but Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I can't get the foundation people in until I have approval, so. Yeah, I think your assessment's correct, actually, is the, the application in front of you to issue out an approval on that, we would essentially be having to close the public hearing to issue it. So if you wanted to add on other components, it would either recause a new public hearing, which would have to be advertised and things, or uh, you're kind of kind of stuck. So I know I know that's an unfortunate situation, but that's unfortunately the way the, the act and the bylaw are structured. Worried about that structure. Yeah, I'm sorry. Understood. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I could raise a point on that, if if just thinking out loud, and I don't know whether this is acceptable to uh, Caroline and, and Robbie, uh, but we're going to be coming back with additional materials and uh, 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 some revision to the plans based upon the discussions that we've just had. So if we withdrew the part of the application that related to the ramp uh, and asked you to close the hearing now and act only upon the, um, uh, the other aspects of it, we could come back with a new um, notice of intent uh, to, or, to, or I guess would be a new, a new amended order request for the, um, uh, for, the, for the ramp that would be heard at the future meeting when we were going to be coming back with some additional things anyway, so. Uh, yeah, that would, yeah. And then that would put us to the 28, we'd have to then, we'd have to then come in for the 28th. I think this is the next meeting, the 28th, Joe? We um, have a meeting on the 11th and then the 28th. So if we, but if we're saying if we withdrew, I'd have to file another amended order request just for the, for the ramp. So I'd have to refile that, re-notify abutters and everything else, because that would be a new amended order application. Right. Now, I, the, is it the, tw the, 28th, the 28th is a Sunday. Actually, the 25th. 25th. 11th and the 25th. Yeah, that's more like it. I mean, so it would delay it would delay that by two weeks, but it will at least get you the, the fact for the garage would be um, would be dealt with under this amended order. So, so okay. it is. Yeah. The thing that concerns me about that is we've now just had like so much discussion as part of the record about the ADA compliance. And then if we withdraw now, we kind of lose that aspect of the record moving forward and need to almost rehab this discussion is my feeling on that. Correct. Um, Ian. Well, I also, um, I, I am, I am very reluctant to approve of this ramp in between the 25 and the 50 foot setback. And so I would much rather see, I mean, I, I take Caroline's point about how she doesn't want it in the front of the house, but um, I still, if by putting the garage, by moving the garage and approving where the garage is, if it locks us in, to having the, uh, the ramp on the west side of the house, I think that would be very unfortunate because I would like Marty and the family to really um, try and take our regulations into consideration here and, and the feeling of, well, from my point of view, the feeling of the commission. And I, I felt that uh, Joe um, came up with a reasonable alternative from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I think Seth has a comment and then Joe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm sensitive, Caroline, to your um, desire to get the garage put on the foundation as soon as possible. But in my opinion, even if we um, or the applicant's representative withdrew the part of the ramp from this application tonight, then we would still need a, a new plan that references that to come into the commission so we still wouldn't be able to do that until at least the next hearing 
So, I, I mean, it's up to you and your representatives to figure out what's going to cause the least delay. But I, I don't think we can do anything tonight. I think at minimum, we would still have to have at least one more hearing. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Joe? I, I'm fine with approving the garage being closing out the garage so it can be down. And I mean, they're gonna come back in for the ramp with with uh, revisions. So I think would I have a whole new discussion anyways, based on that anyway. So I think we could break them apart. I think it's really simple to do. Um, and I get, um, you know, to the comment of, you know, someone being embarrassed walking up a ramp. I, I don't really think that's really a case, but I also think that Marty could screen it and make it go away quite easily. Um, I really think there's a couple little things that you, they could round table and come up with a little better plan for us and kind of work with us. Um, but I do think that we could break the two apart personally. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Joe, one question. Was your scenario that with this ramp was still on the west side of the house, it was just narrower, correct? No, take from the, uh, the side access door, take that three foot six uh, access and run it all the way out. But then you can have the ramp go from the west side to the north side running right along the front. So it's still right in front of the parking garage, you know, where they would get off if, if there was a uh, van or whatever. It still accesses up. She comes to the same point almost, and then she can either go to either doorway. So I just we, think it removes sorry. a lot of that uh, side porch fluff that we have on that Wesley okay. side to really reduce a lot of impact. But I do think that she should have access to both doorways because I do think if that side door gets a closer to a bedroom, I think that's a wise and, and a needed benefit. And I do think that that's something that we could write in, like Arthur said, you know, and wordsmith this and as it attached to the deed, so it never becomes part of a structure or habitable space. Thank I you. look forward to um, working on that. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Maureen, did you have your hand up at one point or was I imagining that? Uh, no, you weren't. I guess um, what uh, Joe was just saying, I want to, uh, you know, do, thinking about the priorities that I know the family has and, and clearly um, safety and, and accessibility is, 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 is very high up there. And, um, and also, you know, um, comporting with, you know, with our regulations. Um, the, what Joe said about a way to possibly, if, if the ramp is, is moved to the front of the house where it would be visible from the street, which is not, uh, the family would not, would rather not have that, then I, I personally would think that, that looking at priorities, if that ramp could be there yet be screened by something that Marty could do. And, and then you've got, you know, the, you know, trying to, to weigh, you know, prioritize all the things because, you know, it's, we, you know, we get, um, obviously we run into these issues all the times with all the time with houses that have been built, you know, long before anyone thought of these issues or knew where the wetlands were or, or anything else. But now we are, we are factually stuck with where we are. Um, and so I think, I think looking at, moving the ramp to the front of the house and, and screening it in a way that would be as comfortable as possible for the family members. Um, you know, that, that's the, the kind of thing that maybe is, is um, you know, a little, it's out of the box that the family has been looking at, but maybe is something, um, you know, to look at. Um, and I just wanted to add a point about whether we can divide this or not. Um, the, I don't have a problem with, with allowing the garage to go in if that won't um, for if that won't cut off any of the options that we've been talking about, whether we move the whether you would move the ramp to the front of the house or do what Joe was suggesting. Um, if moving, if installing the garage would not um, 
you know, prevent would not, uh, you know what I'm trying to say, would not make it impossible to have uh, one of those alternatives, then I would, I, I'm fine with doing it. But my, my concern would be, we would be, you know, kind of foolishly tying our hands for the sake of two weeks when this is a, a solution that want, you know, we want it, the family and we would want it to be able to be there for a long time. So I, I, you know, the garage driving the train, I, I, I get concerned about. So thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Ian? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just would like to make one observation, um, which is we sort of, back in the day, 30 years ago, we faced this issue with my parents out when we lived near the lighthouse on Baxter Road. And um, the contractor that we had uh, engaged wanted to, uh, long story short, they wanted to turn around the, um, the back of the house, the access from the, from the south uh, east to the northwest. And uh, we impressed on them that with uh, the winter winds coming from the north, that, um, you know, my elderly parents, thank you, Marty, exactly. <laughs> and so <laughs> looking at this, you know, I, I still wonder whether or not going to the east and then coming around to the back to the L would give more protection um, to Mrs. Balzer in the long run and might be something that's worth considering. So, but anyway, um, thank yeah, you. If, thank if you. I may, I, I agree that considering an alternative is a, is a great opportunity that we appreciate the settling of the garage is important to the family and moving forward um, as we hope to do. Uh, I feel confident that we'll be able to return to you with a solution that will be successful for everyone um, with some discussion as normal with families. So um, I greatly consider you or thank you for considering uh, garage today and ramp tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, Jeff, from your uh, perspective, paperwork wise, um, is splitting this up um, gonna be okay? Yeah, so when you approve the amended order is you would approve the amended order to only include the work for relocating the garage. It's shown on the plan still. So all you would just say is uh, essentially in the project description where we put the order is amended to include is it would simply say the order is amended to include only the relocation of the garage and just leave it at that. That's still I'm sure Paul could have an amended plan to you tomorrow also. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, I can. Okay. Well, that's good information. Um, I can have one by Monday. Perfect. We won't meet again until February 11th. So that's when we'll <laughs> see it and discuss it. Um, so at this point, are there any more questions or concerns from commissioners? It's like, no. Um, so if not, um, would somebody like to make a motion? <laughs> to um, accept uh, the amended order only approving uh, the new location of the garage. So move. Uh, Mark, are you making the motion? I'm making the motion provided it does not interfere with any proposed uh, handicap uh, ADA ramp. Okay. Second that. Seconded by Joe, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. That carries unanimously. Uh, and I just want to thank the project representatives and um, the, the family for discussing this with us because, again, we, we recognize the importance of the ADA compliance um, and we understand that you want to, you know, preserve the integrity of Nantucket. So thank you. Well, we thank you for the very thoughtful way that you've handled this discussion tonight too. 
All right. So we will see you guys again at a future meeting. Thank you, everyone. Definitely. Thank you. So this moves us on uh, to requests for determination. We have the town of Nantucket C Street PS FM number three alignment. Uh, Mark. Uh, Madam Chair, do we set a date to continue that, uh, or will it be a new application for the? It'll be uh, a new. It'll be a new application. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we're in request for, for determination, town of Nantucket. We have uh, Madison Gleason, Frank Oyet, and I'm sorry I pronounced that wrong again, I'm sure, uh, and David Gray. Hello, um, thank you. Um, Joanne, I'll just say next when you go to the next slide, if that works. Um, all right, hi everyone. Um, so I'm an assistant engineer with Hazen and Sawyer, and I'm before you tonight to request a determination of applicability to implement a new wastewater force main from C Street Pump Station to Surfside Wastewater Treatment Facility. Next. Okay, so um, the owner of this project is the town of Nantucket. Um, Hazen and Sawyer is the project representative um, and the design engineer is Environmental Partners. Um, so to represent this project to you here tonight, um, you have myself and my colleague, Frank Ayotte, who's an associate vice president with Hazen and Sawyer um, and the project manager on this contract. And as you said, David Gray, um, who you probably all know as a sewer um, director of Nantucket. David, you wanna say a few words? Good evening, everyone, I can. Um, thank you everyone for listening to this. Um, this um, project has probably more uh, impact on me than anybody after living through the uh, force main failure of January 4th, 2018. Um, that's one thing I do not ever want to go through again. Um, but uh, the reason that we are in front of you tonight is to, just for the, uh, the determination of applicability. Um, we did some extensive um, walkthroughs, explorations, um, and just planning on this proposed plan that we have in front of you. Um, and the biggest reason that this plan was chosen, the route that was chosen is along every route that we're going down, the sewer and water and stormwater is also uh, going to be replaced at the same time, many of which is over 100 years old, uh, a lot of the gravity sewer lines. So um, I just wanted to jump in and say thank you, everybody. And uh, I'll be here for questions uh, as well. And I'll let Madison just go from there. Thank you, David. Um, so I may reiterate some of those things David just said, but yeah, um, we're excited for this project. Um, it's definitely needed after that force main break. Um, so just a little background. There are two force mains um, currently, which convey wastewater from C Street Pump Station to Surfside Wastewater Treatment Facility. Um, and these force mains consist of a 20 inch ductile iron force main constructed in 1981 um, and a 16-inch polyethylene force main um, installed in 1982. Um, this was used to rehabilitate that existing cast iron force main from 1929. Um, as J David just said, um, there was a force main rupture um, on January 4th, 2018 of the 16 in inch polyethylene force main um, that was located in the downtown and historic district. Um, and there was a sanitary, sanitary sewer overflow um, and discharged at least 2 million gallons of untreated sewage into the Nantucket Harbor. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so these um, depict the 16 inch polyethylene, which is the top orange pipe. Um, this is the one that had failed and that 20 inch ductile iron force main um, on the bottom in red, both going from C Street to Surfside um, Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, next please. Okay, project need. Um, so after that force main break, environmental partners was brought in to conduct a forensic investigation and they found that the cause of the failure was that joints were not fused properly um, at the point of rupture and there were also se several shallow covers along the original installation location. Um, in addition, they decided that the 16 inch polyethylene force main um, isn't reliable, bec rel reliable because um, of the long in the long term because it's 35 years old. Um, environmental partners also concluded that the 16 inch force main should only be used on an emergency basis because it's too vulnerable for additional failures. Thank you. Um, 
So after this investigation, environmental partners did conclude that the best course of action would be to design and construct a third force main from C Street pump station to Surfside um, wastewater treatment facility. And um, we'll call this C Street pump station uh, force main number three. Um, and this will allow the town to abandon that existing 16 inch force main and assess and rehabilitate the existing 20 inch ductile iron force main, um, which can be used as a backup to this new force main. Next, please. Okay, so um, this picture shows the new force main route highlighted in blue um, and all of the streets along the route within that table, um, in addition to the length of the force main within each of those streets. Um, so it's important to note that all construction along this route is within the town owned public right of way um, and the new force main will be installed adjacent to any existing utilities. Um, this route is about 3.4 miles long. Um, it's shorter than that existing 20 inch ductile iron force main uh, in red um, and which will be used as backup um, and it's longer than that yellow 16 inch um, polyethylene force main which will be abandoned. Yeah, so stay on, stay on that uh, figure, please. Um, yeah, the slide before. Um, so this force main will be constructed of 20 inch and 24 inch PVC piping. Um, the connection from the new force main to the C Street pump station and Surfside wastewater treatment facility um, will also be made within the right of way. Um, the new force main will connect the existing 20 inch ductile iron pipe outside of the pump station um, and it'll end by connecting to the a 20 inch ducti ductile iron manifold pipe leading to the treatment facility. Um, so now I'll just show you a quick overview of the route um, and point out some of the key areas of consideration when we were designing this force main. Um, so it exits C Street pump station to the west and it goes down, you can kind of follow the blue line here, it goes down C Street, um, Step Lane and Center Street, which all fall within that downtown historic district area. Um, so this was one of the areas we, we really had to consider um, for the design team. Um, they had to address um, why, why they were choosing this route um, and they had to consider the preservation of this historic district because it's obviously extremely important. Um, so it's necessary to use this route to have the redundancy um, to prevent any additional flooding of the force main um, or force main ruptures just as 16 inch force main had. Um, and I'll remind you again that this route will be in the town and public right of way. So we'll cause as minimal uh, disturbance to the area as possible. Um, so then we can continue down the route. We go from Lily Street, uh, Liberty Street, uh, Winter Street, Pine Street, Silver Street, Pleasant Street, Atlantic Ave, eventually onto Surfside Ave, um, or Road, sorry. Um, so Surfside Road, um, the new, this new force main will run parallel to the existing 20 inch ductile iron force main between Vesper Lane and Hopper Farm Road. Um, and then it turns down South Shore Road to the treatment facility. Um, you probably also notice those pink dots. Um, so the, on, those pink dots represent cross connections along the route. Um, so there'll be a cross connection, connection to the existing um, Surfside Road pump station and the future Surfside Road pump, pump station. Um, and there will be, there's a planned connection to the Madiket Warren Landing pump station connection, but that's also still in the works. Don't know like, the exact location of that. Um, and then there will be also be that uh, cross connection to the 20 inch ductile iron force main. So we'll use that as backup um, in the case of maintenance or excess flow. Um, now you can go to the next slide. Okay, um, so utility replacements. Um, there is potential conflict as, as David had mentioned with existing utilities in the public right of way. Um, that will need to be replaced due to the construction of this force main. Um, and in addition, the town is going to take that opportunity to coordinate with previously identified utility replacement projects that may need to be, um, that may need to be replaced due to the age or condition of pipes, um, and that will lessen construction in the future. Um, so this table you see here um, shows the existing water mains, gravity mains, and stormwater systems um, along the street. Along, the, along each street within the route that may be a candidate for replacement. Um, so all of these replacements would be completed prior to the installation of force main number three uh, to minimize any conflicts during construction. Um, and where any crossing of utilities occurs that are not in conflict, um, this new force main will go underneath um, those utilities. 
Next, please. Okay, so construction considerations. Um, we will need to consider some dewatering and stormwater management as it is expected that a majority of the route will, will use open cut, cut trench excavation methods um, and the installation of the force main must be completed in the dry. Um, along those narrower streets, such as Step Lane or Center, Center Street, the force main installation will be trenchless. Um, luckily, a majority of this force main is above the water table, um, so there's less need for dewatering. Uh, but in the cases that we will need dewatering, um, sump pumps and silt sacks will be used to prevent sediment from entering the sanitary sewer or storm drains as it's pumped from the trenches. Um, all water discharged from temporary dewatering and drainage systems will be disposed of in accordance um, with state and federal sedimentation and control plans, in addition to approval by local authorities um, as we get closer to the start of construction. Um, in addition, there are some temporary erosion and sediment controls. Um, we will use where necessary. Um, examples of this are actually on the next slide. Okay, so here are some examples um, of those sediment controls um, that we can use to protect the existing utilities. So that left image shows um, a silk sack that goes underneath a grate um, of a catch basin to collect any sediment from the street before it enters the drainage system, um, or in this case, being pumped from the trenches. Um, and then to the right, that image is so showing a dewatering bag, um, which connects to a discharge pipe of a, of a pump. Um, so it filters out the sediment from the water within the trench. And then we have an additional layer of protection um, on this image to the right. Um, that, that oval shape, um, that is a filter sock. So that's um, also going to catch the sediment before it discharges out. Next, please. Um, so some additional construction considerations um, for surface restoration. Um, so measures for restoration of all types of pavements and surfaces um, applicable on this route are listed here and have been designed by by environmental partners. These designs will be approved by the Nantucket Historic Commission prior to construction. Um, so these include the, a temporary trench restoration of pavement, um, both weekly and daily. And we actually have the um, drawing made by, by environmental partners on the right here. Um, and then there's also a permanent trench restoration of pavement, full depth um, reclamation of typical pavement sections, cobblestone and brick roadway restoration, driveway restoration and sidewalk restoration. Um, for sidewalk restoration, um, there are several sidewalks along this route that have pre-existing ADA compliance issues. Um, so the restoration of the sidewalks and curbing will aim to mitigate these ADA compliance issues by widening those sidewalks to 30 inches um, of clearance where possible. But if it's not possible, environmental par partners will have to uh, apply for a waiver. Um, and then all of these surface restorations have been designed um, to cause as little disturbance to the roadway neighborhoods as possible and all roads will be restored to their pre-construction conditions or better. Um, and then lastly, we just have our project schedule. Um, so we've completed task one um, and going towards task two um, and we're trying to get the contract to bid in this for this spring and um, we hope to for the project be awarded by June 30th um, to be in compliance with our SRF loan that we received. Um, and then we hope to start construction early fall uh, around that time. Um, so that's the completion of this presentation. Thanks for your time. Uh, does anyone have questions? Thank you, Madison, for that presentation. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like um, no. Oh, Ian? <laughs> well, you're going right past my door. So should I have uh, should I have recused myself there, David? <laughs> anyway, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it doesn't look like we have any other comments. Jeff, what is um, staff's recommendation here? So I think we are recommending. I just want to make sure I get the numbers correct. That. Uh, a negative two and a negative three. So the negative term, negative two is for work in the area subject to protection, but will not remove fill dredge or alter the area. And the negative three is for buffer zone work. So we're recommending those two. 
Thank you, Jeff. Thank uh, you. Maureen? Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Oh. Not a negative two. Sorry, I had the wrong one. Yes, negative two. Sorry, I was <laughs> wrong again. Negative two, negative three. Thank you. Um, uh, th thank you. Uh, no, not okay. Um, one thing uh, through the chair, um, Madison. I was wondering, um, you know, how obviously uh, we, you know, the town things, you know, were very old by the time we ran into this horrible problem. What is the anticipation of the the lifespan of this? And um, well, I guess I don't need to know how we're going to check on it. That's not your job, but. But what is the expected lifetime of uh, once this gets done? Um, Frank may be able to speak to this better than I can. Oh. Yeah, um, uh, Madam Chair, this is uh, Frank A. Yeah, from from Hazen and Sawyer, um, a consultant with, along with Madison, um, with the town's owners, project manager for the project. Uh, typically, um, based on the material of the um, of the pipeline, you can expect a a a, a fifty year type of lifespan with a PVC pipe um, uh, of this nature. Um, it is a plastic pipe um, and, you know, similar to um, other pipes, you know, it's hard to put a, a, just a complete number on it, but uh, definitely a, a, around 50 years is the lifespan of a pipe like this. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Um, any other questions from commissioners? And if there's not, would anybody like to make the motion to issue a negative two and a negative three? Uh, motion made by Seth, I think seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Eritzman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great Thank presentation, you. Madison. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, David. Um, all right, so that moves us on to Lower Shimo Nominee Trust at 42 Shimo Pond Road, uh, represented by Art Gasparro. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm before you tonight with a project that involves the conversion uh, from an on-site septic system for a uh, waterfront property located in Shimo to connect to the uh, town low pressure uh, sewer force main that was installed in the roads out there as part of the um, uh, project recently by the town. And um, we have a situation where we've got a fairly deep um, uh, tank that exists right now and we're trying to work with uh with the grades and so our options are, are somewhat limited in terms of uh piping that already exists so we've come up with this alternative which um it does involve work within the buffer zone though we stay outside of the 25 and we would be putting in a um uh low pressure uh pump a duplex pump system inside of a waterproof concrete basin and um, abandoning or pumping and filling the existing septic system and tying into the uh, to the town system. And we show the sill fence limit of work in green, the 25 foot buffer zone. The resource area is a, uh, a coastal bank, which partially has a, a bulkhead and partially is just a uh, regular bank. And we're also just outside of the limit of land subject to coastal storm flowage. I'd uh, be happy to take questions or concerns. I believe it's a you know, clearly beneficial project, obviously getting onto the sewer system and eliminating a on-site system that's immediately adjacent to the harbor. Thank you, Art. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Jeff, what is staff's recommendation here? Our recommendation would be for a negative three to allow the work without the notice. Um, would anybody like to make the motion to issue a negative three? A motion made by Dave, seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. 
Topham. Aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you, Art. Thank you. And that moves us to Morton Family Realty Trust at 15 Gardner Road, represented by David Haynes. Actually, um, oh. I think that's, this one's mine, Madam Chair, Jeff Blackwell here. Okay, sorry about that, Jeff. That's okay. Um, this is a uh, project that is, uh, proposes to connect an existing dwelling to the newly installed town sewer system in uh, Gardner Road. And um, the work that will take place within the buffer zone is within an existing driveway where a pressure line will be installed to connect the house to the new system. And um, uh, there's about uh, a stretch of about 60 feet where the piping will be within about 40 feet of the wetland at its closest point. Um, and all the other work will um, be at a greater distance and um, also leaving the wetland buffer zone as it approaches the house. So it's um, similar to the last project before you, it's, it's a, simply a connection to the new town sewer system. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, are there any questions from commissioners about this one? Yeah. Looks like no. Uh, Jeff Carlson, does staff have a recommendation? Negative three. Negative three, perfect. Uh, is there a motion to issue a negative three? So move. Uh, motion made by Joe. Uh, Mark, were you seconding that one? Yep. Okay, so we'll give Mark the second. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Uh, Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and that moves us on to certificates of compliance. We have Drumlin Realty Trust at 86 Quidnet Road, uh, represented by Don Bracken. Oh, you're muted, Don. All right, uh, I'm back, thank you. Um, we're trying to close out a 1983 permit uh, issued for a septic system upgrade. Um, we had to do some legwork to get the septic system closed out. We had to excavate it, inspect it, and then we also had to put a new well in in order to get 100 foot separation. Um, but other than that, I believe it's in compliance with the original plan from 1983 which had very limited information on it. Thank you, Don. Um, are there any questions from commissioners? Uh, Mark? Looking at the old approval, Al Silva, Paul Wayne, Paul Bennett, Ben Richmond. <laughs> great names there, folks, long gone, but great names. Okay. Um, Jeff, uh, has staff been out to check this one? Yes, and we kind of leave out the Board of Health a little bit for, for our septic ones, but for this one, but we agree that it's uh, it's in compliance, I guess. It's okay. Almost older than me, but it's, it's good. <laughs> it's right there with my birth year. <laughs> um, all right, is there a motion to issue the cert? Issue. Uh, motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Popham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Um, and that moves us on to 48 Walsh Street nominee trust at 48 Walsh Street, also represented by Don Bracken. Uh, yeah, this project was just wrapped up. Um, it, it just started a couple of years ago. 
Um, everything that was constructed, in our opinion, was done according to the uh, original design plan and order of conditions. Thank you, Don. Uh, are there any questions from commissioners on this one? Uh, Jeff, has staff been out to uh, inspect the site? Yes, and we would agree that it's in compliance. And, and just as a quick aside, uh, this was a property where we had some water discharge issues off the back onto a neighboring property. And uh, this project has eliminated that. And I, I, I thank them for making sure that they were uh, playing nicely with their neighbors. And it turned out turned out pretty nice. Good. Um, well, with that, is there a motion to issue the certificate? Motion made by Mark. Uh, for a second. Second. No, oh, I think Dave got you. I'm going to give Dave the second. Uh, so by roll vote, uh, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Uh, Topham. Oh, Joe, I I couldn't hear you. Aye. There you go. Aye. I don't know what was happening. Uh, all right, so that one carries unanimously. Uh, thank you. That, thank you, Don. Um, and then that moves us on to Safe Harbor uh, Realty Trust at Two Harbor View Way. Oh, and I guess we're we're voting to accept a withdrawal on that one. Um, so, is there a motion to accept the withdrawal? A motion made by Maureen. Uh, was that seconded by you, Seth? Yep. Okay, uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, <clears throat> aye. Holding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously and is withdrawn. Uh, and that moves us on to Lenhart at 25 Dukes Road, uh, represented by Jeff Blackwell. Jeff, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, request in order to satisfy um, a lending institution. Um, uh, usually we're um, dealing with a home that is in a project that is nearly complete, but there's just a little ways to go. The, this particular house that is under construction has been framed and there are uh, probably another six months to go before it will be complete, but um, the owner needed to comply with the uh, request from the bank in order to um, demonstrate that the, you know, the project is on the right track and, and a partial certificate of compliance is in order. So um, it's a little out of the ordinary, but um, you will have uh, your final review of the project when it is completed in si some six months or so. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any uh, questions or comments from commissioners on this one? Jeff um, Carlson, I'm assuming um, it's appropriate in this case to issue the partial certificate. Yeah, so I think the motion you would want to make is to issue the partial certificate certifying that the building is being constructed in the correct location. I think that's the way to put it because you don't want to close out any of the other work that's covered. So it's certifying that it's foundation is in the right spot. Okay, thank you. Um, would somebody like to make a motion to issue the partial certificate that the buildings are uh, being constructed in the correct location? So moved. A motion made by Joe, seconded by Dave. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Uh, Engelborg? Aye. Erickson, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening. You too.
Um, and that brings us on to Boynton at 14 North Cambridge Street, represented by Paul Santos. Uh, thank you. For the record, Paul Santos with Nantucket Surveyors. This is a certificate of compliance request for a septic system replacement at 14 North Cambridge Street out in Madiket. Uh, this was a system that had failed an inspection due to groundwater separation. Uh, this is a new IA nitrogen removal system. It's been installed in accordance with our plan and order. Uh, we have a certificate of compliance from the Board of Health and all the rep rep requisite paperwork uh, with regard to the IA system um, startup, deed notice, et cetera. So we're asking for uh, issuance of certificate of compliance. Thank you, Paul. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Mm -hmm. Looks like no. Um, Jeff, what is your recommendation here? We can issue the certificate of compliance. Oh, perfect. Um, is there a motion to issue the cert? Motion made by Maureen, seconded by Dave. Also by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Uh, Engelborg. Aye. Harrison, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to orders of conditions. Um, hopefully everybody uh, saw those in their um, email from Jeff earlier. So I will apologize. I, I do have it to share when I, I meant to put all of them in that we did, uh, but I inadvertently omitted sending you guys 43 and a half Shell Street. So I'll share my screen when we get to that one. It's a pretty straightforward one. So uh, I don't often have to package together like 10. So I missed one on my list. All right. Um, well, that sounds good. Um, so we'll start uh, with Hedges LLC at 10 Bassett Road. Yes. So this was for the, uh, this was for the pool. So I just had kind of our pool special conditions and couldn't really think of anything else. Give everybody a minute to read it over. Um, to see if you have any amendments or thoughts. like no um so is there a motion to approve as drafted so moved there a second second seconded by joe so by roll vote beal aye engelborg aye erickman aye golding aye lafleur <clears throat> aye uh phillips aye topham aye All right, that carries unanimously uh, and that moves us on to uh, Randy Sharp at One Wamas Wood Place. So this is one just to kind of run through it. This was for the, the driveway uh, relocation and the installation of the shed. And it does have a pool. So I called out the pool and the additional findings that it's located outside of jurisdiction but I added in that it may not be drained or discharged to an area within commission jurisdiction. So we're not really directly conditioning it. We're just telling them that we see it. Don't put your water in our jurisdiction. <clears throat> and, then, yeah. yep, and then just some photo monitoring because there's a little bit of restoration work with um, abandoning in that old driveway. Perfect. Um, any thoughts from commissioners? not is there a motion to approve as drafted to approve a motion made by joe is there a seconded by maureen so by roll vote beal aye engelborg aye erisman aye golding aye lafleur aye phillips aye topham aye that carries unanimously and um, that moves us on to William F. and Elizabeth A. Scannell at 119R Eel Point Road. And I recuse on this. Thank you for that reminder, Seth. All right, so the draft I sent you guys is gonna be a little bit of a lie 
because I added some stuff based upon our discussion um, that I'll, I'll read in. Or if you want me to share my screen, I can do that too. Um, maybe go ahead and share your screen, Jeff, just so everybody can see it. Sorry, I have a lot of open windows all of a sudden. All right, can everyone see that now? Yes. So I added in an additional finding because uh, typically for, for new construction within the 100, we have to put the specific conditions for coastal engineering structures, but the dwelling is currently outside of 100. So I added this finding that the commission finds that the dwelling shown on the plan of record are currently located outside of commission jurisdiction, but will not qualify as pre-1978 structures should they move into jurisdiction. That's kind of the most clever way I could think of to, to say that without bending it too far. Uh, and then I added on this condition 24 kind of from Ashley's comment for discussion. And that's, should the pool or other structures enter the 50 foot setback, the applicant shall appear before the commission to discuss future management and maintenance of the locus. Thank you, Jeff. I think that's a good one. That is a good one. That's very important because people have to understand that their property now comes under a different purview. It's differently considered. Well, I, I don't think it's as much as differently considered as much as it's just a, you have a pool that's 50 feet away. Your bank is eroding. What's the plan? Like, what, what are you guys going to do? I think it's something that, I, I think it's good because it starts that conversation for people that have coastal properties to say, you guys need to be thinking ahead of how you want to manage your property to not cause problems or or do those things. So we'll give it a try, I think. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a, a good um, first try at this one for sure. Sorry, three years from now, we'll look at it and be like, that was terrible. We need to do no, I don't think so. No, it's, I think it's a great yeah. idea. But yeah. We'll, we'll say things like, we should have been way more specific, but yeah. we'll see. You got to always start somewhere, you know? Yeah, I think it's a great start. Um, I'll move for approval. Okay. Um, is I'll there a see. second? Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Uh, Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. So that carries with Commissioner Engelborg recused. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, and that moves us on to uh, Killian at 10 Mayhew Lane. All right, so I kind of have a pile of stuff in this one. Um, I have our, our, our new pool conditions that are there. Uh, condition 24 is for that annual report. Uh, 25 is for no cultivars. 26 is uh, kind of an invasive species requirement. And then we've been adding these in on these restorations where people have been planting. Um, I wish I would have put kind of condition 31 by number 27, but it's essentially that once they've started to do those plantings, that they need to file a partial certificate of compliance that they've done it. Uh, that way we don't get these situations where I'm not saying that this would happen in this case by no means. So if they're represented, I know Brian's not on, but if he hears or watches later, uh, where people do the work that they want to and don't get to the work that they're doing to offset their impacts or their mitigation work as well. So condition 27 kind of memorializes that fact for kind of starting monitoring for us. And that goes with 31 that they have to provide a contract showing that they have someone engaged to do the, the actual restoration work and the monitoring. Um, and then there's just some survivorship. So then I added a 29 that they mark the edge of that area with some sort of permanent marker so they don't go back into the 25. And then I remembered from that site, there's some weird odds and ends in that area, a couple bricks and some other things that they need to remove that debris from those renaturalized areas. The bricks have probably been there longer than the house, but when they start monkeying around in there, it's nice to get rid of them. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, great. 
You know, I'm really pleased because that occurred to me when we were talking about it. So I, I move to approve as drafted. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrison, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. That carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to uh, Cedar Viewpoint LLC at 40 Shakamo Road. Pretty short and sweet. Yeah, it didn't really have a lot. I mean, it, it they're taking a lot of structural components apart and kind of moving them back. Um, so I just kind of asked for some yearly photo monitoring, but they're not really adding anything new. They're just kind of going the other way. So uh, any other thoughts from commissioners or is there a motion to approve as drafted? Also move. Motion made by Beal. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Uh, Engelberg. Aye. Harrison, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. And that moves us on to Old North Wharf Cooperative Incorporated at uh, Old North <coughs> Wharf, Nantucket Harbor. Uh, Jeff, you didn't try very hard with your conditions. You only got one. Uh, it's the same one that I have on all of them too, Mark. It's the same, like you got to follow know. the materials you submitted, but I was really struggling to come up with one for, I mean, arts work protocol. And that was pretty straightforward that we're going <laughs> to walk down the walkway. We're going to take out some screws take the board away, put a new board in and screw it down. I was really kind of struggling to come up with. This is a problem. This, this is one of the ones where you probably just should go ahead and do it, but keep that quiet. Yeah. So, yeah, this is one that, I mean, not to belabor the point with everybody and, and hold us on here longer is Art and I talked about it quite a bit as far as maintenance goes and, and percentages. And I think we just decided, especially given the linear footage that's here and, you know, these projects tend to, even if you think you're just going to replace a section, you know, like, well, we got a couple extra boards left or, or something happens and you replace it. We just decided it was probably smarter just to do it as a permit and then not think about it from there. So it was on the fence. Uh, so is there they originally installed that dock. Oh. Wow. Dave, I think the better question is which dock or pier you have not installed, not the ones that you have. Less than I put in. <laughs> Um, Beth, did you have something to say? Are you making a motion? Yeah, I'll move for approval as drafted. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded by Maureen. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrison, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. That carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to 59B Pulpus Road, LLC, at 59B Pulpus Road. So this was for the, the other pool. This was the one that we originally had viewed as an RDA and, and probably smartly moved it over here to get a, a, a better set of conditions. Um, but this was for the, the pool um, and some site work. And this was the site that, that Brian Mallon, Madden did the... Uh, pretty good analysis for potential vernal pool to kind of discuss that. So um, it's just kind of our standard pool conditions. Jeff, how long have we put in the condition that they must contact you prior to draining? How long has that been around? Uh, we just started doing that in the last, like probably that's less than six months, unfortunately. That's good. Because you're going to uh, get better in about a year. Longer. No, I, I could probably find it going back, but um, it was sometime in, in I feel like mid 2020 where that got added. I, I predict was, that in the, at some point in the near future, you'll be buried with phone calls saying I'm draining. You know what? I, I would rather have more phone calls and emails and I know what to do with for saying that than to have to answer the like seemingly endless phone calls from panicked neighbors or someone saying that they're draining a pool into my backyard or they're draining a pool into their pond. 
and all of those, I would much rather get the, hey, we're going to drain this pool on this day, and this is where we're going to put it, and and no, then, then the other way around. So, so those tickets are hard to write. You got to press through five sheets. It's much easier to get advanced warning. So, you got to toughen up there, Jeff. You can get through them. <laughs> get better, heavier pen. I'll move for approval. Heavy pen. <laughs> Called the long arm and the heavy weight of the law. So, uh, Mark just made a motion for approval on this one. Um, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Joe. So, by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Borg. Aye. Harrison, aye. Golding. Aye. Sir. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. And that carries unanimously. Maybe we should move to get Jeff a better pen. I yeah. can take care of that for you. Don't worry. Okay. Um, so that moves us on to Lynn F. Berlin at 2 Francis Street. Sorry, Mark. This was another one. This was the um, the driveway modification down on Francis yeah. Street. Love the name, Lynn Berlin. So, Very nice are. one. Yeah. They've owned that property for a long time. That's been good. I did some permitting for them back in like 2002 on the, the house that's there. Very good. Um, is there a, are there thoughts on this one or, or is there a motion to uh, issue as drafted? The issue is drafted. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, so that moves us on um, to the Susan Elliott Weiss at all trustees at 43 and a half Shell Street. And Jeff, do you want to share your screen for this one? Yes, and it's not that complicated of an order, but um, since I, I missed the pack with it. So this was the set of um, stairs that we talked about a little bit tonight for either being wood or granite. Um, so I didn't really have any conditions. Again, it seemed pretty straightforward once you guys kind of talked through the material. So that's what it is. Thank you, Jeff. Any thoughts from commissioners on this one? Would we be worried about lighting or anything? We could put a condition 19 that no lighting is permitted by this order. Yeah. And so what didn't really come up or was discussed, so. Surprise. I have a question, Ashley. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Maureen, I couldn't see my screen. Yes, well, all right. Um, do we need to say anything about the, the you know, any um, shaping of the granite blocks shall be done, you know, um, out of the buffer zone or? Um, I'm you know, not. The, the issue of the chipping the blocks, you know, they, they said that, that um, Paul said they would be doing it up above if they had to do any and most of it, do we care about making that a condition? Um, yeah, I'm not so sure. Not shaping them, you know, down there on, on the uh, dune. Right, and that was a question that uh, Joe had asked. So yeah. um, what right. do you think, Joe, put that as a condition? No, I definitely think, I think thank you, Maureen, for reminding us. Yeah, because he so, said if we had to, we'll do it up there. So we might as well just say that. Yeah. Yeah, it was David, David Hayes, um, said they would cut them all up by the house. Yeah. Nice when I share screen, you guys can just see what I type. So. I know you're, you're a fast typist. I'm impressed. Thank you. I get more practice than I would like. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on this one from commissioners? And if not, is there a, a motion to approve as amended? Motion to approve as amended. Um, 
So I'm going to give the motion to Joe and the second to Ian. Um, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. That carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Marianne Jones at 6 East Lincoln Avenue. Hmm. So this was the flood zone project where they were converting the, not converting, they were removing the existing shed and turning it into a studio. And the only condition that I added was that no filler grade changes are permitted by the order. But other than that, that's a pretty standard flood zone condition for us. Thank you, Jeff. And I'm assuming you updated the file number during the meeting. Yes, it now says 3384. Perfect. Um, so if there aren't any amendments from commissioners, is there a motion to approve as drafted? I moved. Um, made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Maureen. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. That carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to extension of orders of conditions, 12 North Road Trust at 12 North Road, uh, represented by staff. Yes, yes. sorry. I'm just so, so this, this is an extension. Hey, Joe. Oh, I got her. Sorry, I was just super echoey there. Uh, so this was an extension for um, 12 North Road. This was for us, I'm just bringing it up. Um, this was for some invasive plant management along this. If you remember, this was the project that um, started kind of an enforcement with the, the wonky wall and the rocks and Wilkinson has been working on it. So they've asked to extend um, to finish the repairs on the bulkhead, um, but then also to continue their monitoring on the logs in the vegetation that they installed. And the project is currently in compliance for the work that is done. And I know they're waiting for the structural work on the bulkhead, but we're recommending that the extension could be issued. Thank you, Jeff. Is this for just one one year or three one years or? They requested it for the three one year extensions to make sure that they get that full monitoring window in. Okay. Um, so is there, are, are there any questions um, and if not, is there a motion to issue the extension for uh, three one-year extensions? So moved. So Second. motion by Dave, seconded by Maureen. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. <clears throat> that moves us on to approval of minutes from January 7th. Um, I think that should be 2021 on there. Um, is everybody okay with the minutes? I just had one thing which I, I forgot to, I sent something to Joe while um, just before the meeting. Uh, uh, Terry, you have to put an S on the end of my name. <laughs> I did forward it over to her for you. <laughs> That's right. Sugar. Sure. Um, any other um, issues with the minutes? Um, and if not, is there a motion to approve um, with amending uh, Maureen's name? Uh, motion made by Seth. I think that was seconded by Mark. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Uh, I wasn't present, so I abstain. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. So that uh, carries with Commissioner Golding abstaining. 
Uh, and that, um, thank you, Terry, for the minutes as always. Um, so, we're so lucky. Yes, so, Jeff? Sorry as about dropping the S. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> So as we transition to monitoring reports, uh, I wanted to let you know, jo Joanne, uh, let me know, all of the documents that need to be signed from tonight's meeting have been sent to you guys to sign. So while we're going through the rest of this, if people want to do that, that's, they're ready to go. She is on her game. She's a miracle worker, that Joanne. Eh, someone's already done. We won't say who, but. We'll leave the suspense if you guys know you haven't signed some of the So, all right, monitoring reports. Yes, some monitoring reports, Pacamo neighbors, uh, 47, 53, 55, 57, 61, 63. Um, I'm not sure if that should be 67 and 69 Pacamo Road. Yeah, that's a typo. Um, does anybody have any questions? Looks pretty stable. <laughs> Am I reading it wrong or is it stable? I think it looks pretty good. I mean, I, I know Art's here for having any questions, but I, I think they're doing a really nice job with that project. So I will say on a sad note, not to, to bring down the meeting by any means, but uh, for those who remember, we talked with uh, Mr. Shapiro a number of times over the couple of years. And for those who didn't see, uh, Mr. Shapiro uh, passed away a few weeks ago. So sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but- um, I knew, I was trying to figure out how I knew him. Oh, that's sad. Is, so, but it, it's nice that the last time he and I talked about the project, uh, despite his wanting to move the delivery location, he did kind of admit to me that it looked like it was it was doing okay. So that was These are the, This is the Pacamo Bluff, isn't it, Jeff? Correct. It's the, the bluff on the north side. It's that stretch. Um, I feel like it's about halfway down the bluff from the, well, when it curved to the point, about half to two thirds. Uh, and it's a pretty substantial project that a group of homeowners did kind of jointly to make sure that the structure was continuous and, and frankly, have been doing a pretty good job and been maintaining the nourishment and have provided all well, of the reports. So it's not the bluff facing town, the west the west facing bluff. It's not that Correct. one. Correct. No, it's the bluff that faces, uh, it kind of faces Cascade upon. Oh. Across the, across the head of the harbor. I put rocks in front of that, blu that bluff. Hope you had permits. I hit them on my safe boat. Doesn't that matter? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. All right. Um, any uh, other questions about this one? No. Like, no. Um, thank you for the thorough uh, monitoring report. We always appreciate, um, I don't want to say getting the good ones, but getting the, the thorough reports. Um, so that uh, moves us on to proposed amendments to docks, piers, uh, and wharves uh, prohibition. Uh, and this is represented by Emily Molden with the Nantucket Land Council. Sure. So while she's unmuting, is Emily has prepared a citizen warrant article for town meeting that is a, an amendment to the zoning uh, island perimeter restriction related to docks and piers uh, that involves our department and uh, hopefully to help you guys. But I'll let her describe it better. And uh, thanks for staying with us. Welcome sure. to the town. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, thanks, Commission. Nice to see everyone. I know you've had a long night, so I will be brief. I just really want to take an opportunity to mostly inform you guys of the proposals that I'm making to change the zoning bylaw as it relates to docks and piers. Um, it's not going to materially affect anything that the Conservation Commission does um, at all. But as Jeff said, it does involve the Natural Resources Department and it's an issue that you guys deal with. So I just wanted to inform you of what I have proposed and to answer any questions. I did provide it in the packet as a very brief summary. Essentially, um, the, the existing regulations currently um, allow for uh, existing docks and piers to be reconstructed as long as they maintain the existing footprint. Um, and 
that just means that a shorter, wider dock could be reconstructed as a longer, narrower dock that might uh, impact a new resource area or navigation, fishing, et cetera. So I've just added language to require a determination be made that there be no um, increased negative impact to the marine environment and then referring the special permit granting authority to the natural resources department and the harbor master for comment. So happy to answer any questions. Just wanted to mostly inform you all of um, what I was proposing. Thank you, Emily. Um, does anybody have any questions, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Emily. So the um, entity that would determine what would, cons what would constitute uh, more detrimental to the marine environment would be the Natural Resources Department? Sure, so the determination would essentially have to be made by the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is the special permit granting authority, but it refers them to the Natural Resources Department and the Harbor Master for their comment and recommendation. Yeah, I just asked because I like the intent of the um, proposed bylaw amendment, but, um, or the citizen warrant article, I should say, but I just think that more detrimental to the marine environment is up to interpretation. So I think maybe including some language as to say um, activities, including but not limited to some things that you think might be relevant, including lengthening the footprint into the harbor or whatever else uh, might be relevant to list out some of those things I think could be relevant, but that's my personal opinion. I also brought this up when we considered, or we began a discussion of considering our regulatory update that I, I mentioned that in the um, Nantucket wetland bylaw and regulations, we should also include a prohibi prohibition on um, pier and wharf um, reconfiguration. But I know it's somewhat um, would be reproducing what the zoning board has done, but I, I think that it's important to have that codified in our regulations as well. Thank you, Seth. Um, Emily, it looks like you have uh, something to add to that or to respond. Sure, I was just gonna um, say that I think it's definitely appropriate for the commission to consider additional uh, regulatory changes under the wetland regs relative to docks and piers. The, this bylaw prohibition that was first added at town meeting in 2008 was really a direct result of a recommendation from the municipal harbors plan. And it was definitely relative to trying to prevent impacts to the marine resources, as well as fishing and navigational um, impacts. And so the language that's added in there really just um, helps to define that even further and then uh, clarifies what other town departments to get recommendations from for that, so. Thank you, Emily. Um, do any other commissioners have questions or comments for Emily? Great to see you, Emily. That's true. <laughs> you guys too. Thanks very yeah. much for your time after yeah. a long evening. Um, no, Emily, thank you for um, thinking about this uh, amendment and proposal at town meeting. It's definitely an important one. Yep, yeah, and just, um, I think, if I may, I think just raising the issue, reminding people that um, they need to be careful about this whole topic. You know, it's been a while since the bylaw was passed and so now this reinforces things. So it's great, great. You guys keep on top of stuff. Yeah. Great, um, if there's no other comments or questions. Um, thank you, Emily, for, for your hard work on this and for keeping us updated. Yeah. Bye, Emily. Have a good one. Good night. Um, okay, so that moves us on to reports. We have crack. Um, so, uh, Arcadis, the uh, consultants, um, have released a, a, their monthly report a few days ago. So, I'll um, forward it to Jeff 
so that Jeff can forward it to everyone. And in fact, while we've been sitting here, Crank has had a virtual open house, but I didn't mention it because, you know, we had other business, so. No, I'm, I, I invited all my AP students to go to that. So I'm hoping some of them showed up and attended. So, uh, I will say as of like 3 p.m. today, they had, I think just over 180 RSVPs to it. So it seemed like it was going to be pretty well attended. So that's a good as, turnout. I mean, you're like rivaling like second night of town meeting with that kind of numbers. So that's pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and that's just, that is RSVPs. That's not any like casual, we're going to show up without RSVPing or, or any of those. So um, it could have been more. And obviously you always, even with RSVPs, get a few no-shows. So, uh, but super encouraging with even just that number showing interest. Was that recorded so that we might be able to watch it after the fact? Yes, I believe it was. So okay. I'll, I'll double check with, with uh, uh, Vince and Arcadis tomorrow, but I'm pretty sure that they were intending to record it. I think the one spot that may be trouble for recording is I know they were intending for part of it to break into some smaller breakout groups, especially with that many people. So I'm not sure if they were able to record like each individual breakout group, but I think they probably would have some sort of summary when they got back. So um, I'll find out for sure. How that, how that Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Um, CPC. Uh, we met on the 19th and we distributed some money to three organizations. And then um, we, we, changed, we rewrote the CPC voting issues because we needed to stagger some members um, at large. So we've done that. That was approved by town council. And then we just kind of went over salaries and office expenses, but pretty much not too much to report. Thank you, Joe. Um, NP and EDC? <clears throat> the meeting was canceled. Okay. Oh, report. Nice and quick. Um, so that brings us to enforcement updates, uh, 27 Washington Street. Yes, really quickly. Uh, our good friend, uh, Bert Balkins, Spruce, uh, who attended the close to resiliency thing and as a glutton for punishment, came back to our meeting said that the final total uh, was that there was 164 attendees and that yes, it was recorded. So that's really good. That's really encouraging. So, uh, and he said, yes, each group summary when we return. So yeah, that's good insider information. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, but to the enforcement update. So we reached out to that homeowner. I think everyone probably has driven by this area at least once in uh, uh, the last, two weeks or so to uh, the, the house that's next to the Mariah Mitchell property with the orange trim on the building. It's the most distinguishable feature. Um, the homeowner sent us the letter that is in the packet and I'll leave it up to you guys to decide what level of action we want to kind of go from from there. Uh, he did just in the last day or so provide us, we, we asked him, he just didn't get back to us, but we got the information on who did that work so I think we were gonna reach out to that landscaping company and say, hey, you guys did a bunch of work that was unpermitted. These are the rules. Um, it's not a company that we've had in enforcement before um, and haven't really encountered too much, um, but just to send them and make sure that they understand all of the rules. And, and if you guys would like to speak with them, we can try to set that up. Um, but uh, whatever you guys wanna do with it, he says they're going to just let it regrow. You know, I think we could kind of monitor and see. It's an easy site to monitor. So uh, whatever you guys would like to do to move forward with it. Thank you, Jeff. The only thing about the regrowth, and I know there was already loose strife in there, but since they went in and did some work that was unpermitted, can we like require them to maybe deal with the loose strife a little bit? I was on mute when I said that, but I said, sure, we certainly can. Um, Seth? 
Yeah, I know the initial issue of enforcement came up um, a few months ago, but do we know when the actual cutting took place? I don't have the exact day, but I have it narrowed down and I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, I'll have to pull it up, but I have it narrowed down to a range of about three days. So I'm pretty close. Can you let us know what that range is? Yes. No, I definitely will. I'll put it all in the email to you guys. I just don't want to I'm think just, through my, the, my notes. The reason I'm going on this track is, in addition to Ashley's comment, I think that um, it's possible that the cutting happens when the plants had already entered the dormant season and we could catch a break. But it's also possible that um, like seed heads were still on plants. And especially if you try to mow loose strife with like active seed heads still on it, it's pretty evident that it's gonna spread a lot in the next growing season. So I think sort of dependent on whether plants were dormant or not, we might require different levels of, of mitigation and monitoring of the site. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull that date. I have a couple of emails back and forth with some people that um, helped report it. And from when I took the photos um, for what's there. So I, I just, I won't waste everyone's time while I dig through the record to find it, but I'll send it to you guys for sure. But according to her letter, Madam <coughs> Chair, between mid-October and early November. Yeah, that sounds pretty yeah. close. <laughs> but see, this is the thing given like normally I would say that's probably a dormant season cut, but given the relatively like temperate falls we've had, it probably wasn't this year. So I think we should definitely require follow-up monitoring at the minimum. And if um, we have any, if there are any um, photos of pre-existing conditions, I don't know if those exist with the applicant or even just like publicly available databases that we can look at and see if there's been a significant increase in invasive coverage, we should definitely require removal of that. So amazingly enough, the best existing conditions photo that I've found is the street view from Google Maps. I know it's a couple of years old, but that was an area that was pretty much undisturbed. So we found that to be at least helpful. I think I actually sent it with my enforcement letter too, that we just had it. And it's like you said, it's publicly available. So it's not like I was trespassing to get it or did anything weird. Um, I will definitely find that for you, Seth, and get you that specific date. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and then we'll, we'll have to see what happens with this one in the future. Yeah. Um, oh, and just for the, sorry, I, I, I said I knew it. So the landscape company that did the work for them is a landscape company called Hey Mo, like M-O-W, like mow grass. Hmm. So. That one is new to me, surprisingly. They're a couple years old. So I had some info on them from um, COVID-19 signups when everyone had to register, which is like the greatest collection of landscaper information ever. But um, you know, you tell them they can't work unless they sign up and all of a sudden we have a million landscapers that sign up. So uh, we have contact information for them and they provided it too. So we'll send them a kind of a follow-up and set up a time to talk to them and Overall. But the IRS might want that list, Jeff, like our painter so, friend. So, well, they, you know, in this new world where, you know, the economy is going crazy and stock market is bananas, they can, they can pay me for my list. So All sell right. it back to the IRS. I want a percentage of what they reclaim. That would be my, my fair, fair price. Gives new meaning to whistleblower. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and now, right now, the black vans and helicopters are descending upon my house for just saying that. So <laughs> the puppies will drive them off. <laughs> They're not there anymore. Can't do it. No, nope. one of them's at my house. <laughs> so, probably sounds. sounds yeah, where is she, Ashley? Can we see her? She, she's sleeping. I'll I'll get her right now. While while we start commissioners' comments, I'll grab her. So, do, do any commissioners have comments? 
Ian, go for it. So um, for the, the Eel Point Road, the windblown sand, which I was very pleased that Paul took that into account, but can we um, add that as a sort of definition okay. and something that we can use in our uh, revamp of our regulations, Jeff? I mean, I mean you, you could try to define a resource area like that, but the, the hard part with windblown sand on Nantucket is you'd have to be very specific for the criteria that's there because you can find windblown sand pretty much everywhere out here. So we've talked about it a lot, and I know when Coastal Dunefield came into uh, existence kind of in the mid-2000s, we talked about it a lot. Um, I think I'd have to do quite a bit of, of research on how that would work in proximity to coastal areas because coastal dunes need to kind of directly, the way they're defined now, interact with the, the coastal beach. So I can I also I wanted to say the same question and we had that windblown sand at that cottage by uh, Auburn, Auburn Cottage between White Elephant and the, uh, uh, um, the breakers. That was windblown sand too up on the, on the grass. It definitely is, right? And, and I think the way we've always looked at it is it really relates to um, a little bit of depth, a little bit of form and function. Um, sometimes like the parent material that's there is important. Um, but coastal dunes have always been something that, and I don't say it's a struggle to delineate, but there's always been a little bit of back and forth on where they are and how they're really behaving and how they connect together. Uh, and then you end up like the site on Eel Point where it's blown up the bank and piled up because it got caught in the vegetation on the top of the bank. It started to accumulate, but it's not directly connected, excuse me, to the, to the free sediments on the beach. So it's a little bit of like a, it's almost like an inland dune, but not a coastal dune. But I'm happy to look into it further. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by Ashley's puppy, who is totally cute. I'm in love, Ashley. <laughs> The worst move, teachers do not like the, the pets coming into the, the classroom setting in the videos, but I'll share with you guys. She's super cute. What's her name? Her name is Fig. Purple. She has a purple collar. So, but yeah. Ador purple. Adorable. Yeah. Cute. Fig. Oh. Earlier, I got her at the start of the meeting. Yes. Um, yeah, she's getting huge. Yeah, she's a big, big girl. To think, at one point, Ashley, I, I held Fig and she weighed like eight and a half ounces. So. Yeah, that's crazy. Tiny. Wow. She was wow. one of the smallest ones when they were born. So. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know it now. No. Oh, big girl. Um, any Thank other commissioners' comments? like no uh, staff administrator reports? Um, I don't think I have anything right now. I already told you Joe sent all the stuff to sign. Um, and I have some stuff to eat. And the saga of 315 Pulpus Road lives on? Yeah, so we've sent them some more stuff and they've paid a couple times. So I sent an email to Detective Kelly uh, about it and waiting to hear back from them. So I believe pulls a farm. I'm a farmer scam. Well, that's the thing is his property doesn't qualify for agricultural exemption. It's too small. So we have, trust me, we have kicked the tires on what could possibly be all of the excuses that are there. So <laughs> no luck. Got to be five acres at a minimum. And his lot is like four and some change. So too small. That's good to know that five acre cutoff. Well, if they didn't have it, like everyone and their brother would be like, oh, I have a farm. And, you know, <laughs> zoning would just not exist for any like rural parcels anywhere. And it, it would be crazy. So. Um, all right. So, um, Mark, do you have another question? I have a question for Jeff about the Larrabee. Is anything happening with the Larrabee farm? Yeah, yeah, so I, I mean, we did. I was impressed that, they came to us. With the Larrabee, Larrabee boys, when they came to oh, us last meeting. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, not to, I don't want to 
you know, speak speak ill by any means, but they came to us because we entered them into enforcement for work that they had done. And then oh. we had a meeting with uh, the, the property that they, that they're using is owned by the land bank and they have some rights to operate on it and function. And uh, I won't say I, I know all the ins and outs of the deal with the land bank, but they came because they, they demoed a house and did some work up front in the buffer zone. We filed an enforcement and then the land bank who got the enforcement said, Ooh, we have a lot of things to address. So we kind of outlined some step-by-steps for them to say, hey, we're going to get the wetlands delineated first. And once those are delineated, then you guys can work with, um, you know, NRCS and, and the Department of Agriculture to get together your farm plan and then start to develop where you're going to have, you know, residential improvements and get some approvals through the land bank. Um, and then after they got all of those approvals, depending on what may or may not need a notice of intent, uh, will be covered there, or they'll have to come before you guys at some point with their uh, their agricultural plan once that's done. So we'll see them a couple more times, um, but they definitely, you know, we asked them to do those things. They did up pretty quickly and on a pretty timely basis, and uh, they're trying to figure their way out through a process that's not super simple, um, and we're kind of helping them along and uh, feel like we're making some good progress with them. So hopefully in the next year, we'll have that site all buttoned up and everyone will know what's going on and the land bank will be happy and we'll be happy and the Larrabees will be off and rolling. Um, the next time we talk about them will be for either monitoring reports or say they're doing such a nice job on their property. So we'll see. Uh, I have a 30 second question, please. Thank you, because I know it's late, but I'm, I'm curious if there's been any resolution of uh, the Pulpers Road and Sackage Pond? What's happening? So, about yeah, so we actually had, we've been talking with Natural Heritage and Mass DEP and with Mass Audubon, and we had been doing the engineering for the Living Shoreline Project there. And we had a meeting this last week, and I can't believe it's basically I meant to talk about this, was uh, we had a meeting last week with with Rob from the DPW, our office, uh, and Horsley Witten, and a separate meeting with uh, that same group, minus Horsley Witten, and then with Sam from Audubon, uh, where we went over all of the conceptual designs that are, are done for that project. Um, our next step, and what we've kind of explained to Heritage too, is we filed, the town filed their, or is filing their MISA checklist to start into their process. And then hopefully at some point, we'll be back in front of you guys for an actual plan of removal and design for at least a replacement for the next three to five years until that larger project is, is designed and ready to go. But I think we've made some, some good progress on it here in pretty short order. So hopefully we'll be back with uh, permitting. We're just trying to, uh, we obviously have to make the property owner that's been impacted with Audubon whole to some degree. And then, Heritage and Mass DEP too. So it's moving a lot of uh, stuff together to get it up and running properly and, and not doing more harm than, than intended. Great, thanks Jeff. No problem. Thank you, so, these are important updates. Yeah, so just with that too, sorry, the conceptual design that's there is still to look at kind of that same living shoreline that's there with a little bit of roadway protection and then still doing that oyster reef habitat offshore to help mitigate some of that wave energy that come across the pond and, and nor'easters and storms that come out of the north. Uh, so we're excited about maybe creating some more shellfish habitat and then also providing kind of a living option on that shoreline, at least in the short term, uh, until the larger scope where we're dealing with the, the connection to the wetland on the other side of the road and the roadway being within the flood elevation can properly get addressed and designed in a way to lessen the impact of that roadway already being there. So hopefully that will be pretty short order. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any other kind of questions for Jeff? If you think of them, feel free to email too. Yeah. So, um, so if not, we are late enough. Is there a motion to adjourn? There is. Motion made by Ian, seconded by Dave. 
Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding. Uh, LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Uh, Fig made the motion, no? She's crying. She wants to go now. She misses, she misses me. me. She does. Bye. Um, all right. So this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks for the Good night, all. Thanks. Good night. Good night, Faye. Bye. Bye.